I have a very loud voice, and this room is not so large, so I'm not going to use a microphone. Can you guys in the back hear me clearly? Okay, perfect. Uh, great. So, um, thank you for joining our governance breakout session. Thank you also to all the other presenters. We actually have a really exciting lineup today. You're going to hear from a number of people, a uh, number of very hardworking, very intelligent people who have thought a great deal about governance from a huge variety of projects. I think we have about 10 projects represented. That's, that's quite exciting. Um, before we kick off, before we dive into governance, uh, I thought it would be very helpful if we start with some basic introductory material. And so I'll just take a couple of minutes now to introduce this um, concept of governance, share some basic terminology. Um, do we have, is it, Takasam, are you checking the time? Do I have a timer or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, and you'll give me? Here, you have um, 19 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should use the microphone because of the recording, right? Sorry? Uh, are they recording the voice? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Do I need to use the microphone? microphone. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so this is for recording? Is it on? Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. Mm, great. Good morning. Cool. All right. Let's dive in. Um, very briefly, by way of background, my name is Lane Reddy. I, first and foremost, am a blockchain core developer. I've been writing software my whole life, and so kind of the way I got into the blockchain space was through the technology and the code. It's still the main lens I use when I think about the blockchain. Um, however, so I, I, I sort of have had this crazy journey over the past two years. I, I worked as an Ethereum core developer for about 18 months to two years, and more recently I've been working on another project called Polka, uh, sorry, Polka Dot, not Polka Dot. <laughs> <laughs> Space <laughs> Mesh. <laughs> it's early. I'm on my first coffee. <laughs> um, uh, but so what I kind of discovered as I was working on uh, some of the core technology is that, you know, technology is not a solution by itself to anything, okay? Technology is a tool that we can use to solve problems, but fundamentally those problems are social problems. And I think it's very critical that we attack the social aspect of those problems first. And one of the problems that I think is sort of unsolved today um, in blockchain as governance, and that's why I care a lot about governance, and I've done a lot of thinking and reading and writing and speaking about it. So uh, this is what we'll talk about in this quick talk, so I'll just share some goals for the talk. We'll talk about what governance is and what we're trying to govern, um, some terminology, a uh, quick glance at the agenda, and then if we have any time left, we can talk some more about Ethereum governance as a case study. So my goals for this talk are pretty straightforward. Um, First of all, everyone just warm up, get some caffeine, uh, <laughs> no more faux pas. Um, I just want to get people on the same page about governance, right? Because governance is a very subjective, complex topic, and uh, the reason I called this talk what we talk about when we talk about governance is because many people mean different things when they talk about governance. So just, just to get your juices flowing, um, we'll kind of talk about some of the different angles of governance and some of the different definitions of it. Uh, and we'll, we'll get some common terminology as well, because you'll hear a lot of these terms used in some of the talks you hear today. Uh, so let's start by answering, or trying to answer, this difficult question, what is governance? Does anyone here want to offer a definition? What? You're paying attention, you seem awake. Well, what does governance mean to you? How we make decisions. How we make decisions, that's a good one. What about you? Um, how we deal with other partners to uh, yeah, get something to be done, done. Good. Yeah, so, so Max has a very good point, which is that so it's very much about making decisions, but and, and you also offered another piece, which is that it, we're not alone, right? It's, it's how we do this with other people. John, what, do you, what, is, uh, what does governance mean to you? I heard some good answers, uh, you know, collective decision making, yeah. the process, execution of decision making. Yeah, process as well. Cool. So, um, I don't intend you to read all of this, but this is just to show you. So this is from an exercise that John and I and, and several several other people in the room participated in recently, a roundtable conversation about governance, where we one of the things we tried to do at the beginning is we tried to define governance, and we came up with all these different answers, uh, grouped into categories. So it's partly about decision making, it's partly about collective action problems, it's 
partly about power and authority, uh, rules, change management. So it's a very, very complex topic. Uh, again, I don't, we don't have time to go through all of these. You're, you're free to review the slides later. Um, but the, the key takeaway for me is that what governance really boils down to is exactly what these two folks over here brought up, which is we have to make decisions together as a community. And that's a very difficult thing to do, right? Because um, we all have different needs, we have different values, we have different preferences. And so we're trying to sort of aggregate those preferences um, and make the best possible collective decisions we can and enact those decisions together. So another very, very important question to answer uh, before we dive into governance is like, what are we trying to govern? And I'm gonna use Ethereum as a case study here because uh, it just helps to have concrete examples and I'm most familiar with Ethereum governance. Um, it's kind of all these things, right? So, like, again, just picking on Ethereum, um, there's the governance of the Ethereum Foundation, right? Uh, and, and the resources it controls. So that's kind of a meat space idea. It's very, very specific. There's also, like, the community, which is also meat space in the sense that it's, you know, human beings in a building, in a room, you know, around the world. But it's much vaguer. It's very difficult to define the community. Um, there's the governance of the core protocol, right? That's a separate question. And, and if there's a specification, like the yellow paper in case of Ethereum, there are independent client implementations, right? Ethereum has something on the order of seven or eight of these, um, and ETH2 has others. Um, and they each have their own governance processes. There uh, is the network itself, right? So this is, you know, individual actors running nodes and, and software upgrading those nodes. There's the data inside, like the blocks, that's the blockchain. And so this is where we have questions about immutability and things like that. There's applications. I'm sure you could add more things to this list. Um, for the purposes of today, we'll mostly be focusing on these two things. Uh, and and it, obviously each speaker has their own take on this, each project has their own take, and you'll hear about other pieces, but kind of the most relevant and concrete pieces are the protocol, how do we govern the protocol, how do we make changes to the protocol, and the data, right? Because again, there's very interesting questions here around immutability and around property rights. Um, so this is this is sort of the main takeaway, right? Is that governance is complex, it's multifaceted, it's subjective. Um, this is my own opinion. There's no one, like when we talk about governance, we have this desire to kind of say, there's good governance, right? Good governance is inclusive. Good governance is democratic. Good governance is representative. And, um, and bad governance is other things or none of those things. It's really not that simple, right? Um, Governance is very situational, and I think that different initiatives need radically different forms of governance. Um, you know, if, if we in this room here, the sort of 30-ish people in this room, were to get together and, um, you know, we had a task, we need to build something or construct something, uh, maybe, you know, we don't need complex governance structures. Maybe it's a small enough room, maybe we trust each other well enough, maybe we speak the same language. Um, that, you know, maybe we decide to do something in, in a more efficient fashion and we elect a leader and, and let that leader be a dictator for some short period of time. Um, and that's maybe perfectly okay, again, in the small context of a small group of people in a small time period. Um, but of course, when we scale out to the level of a blockchain or even further to the level of a society or a continent or a nation state, we need very different things in our governance. So I just want you all to reflect a little bit as you hear these talks today on, um, like, like, what does good governance, what does bad governance mean? Um, what are the criteria? Like, they, while there is no absolute good or bad, there are certain things that I think we can say are sort of properties of many or most good governance systems. And these are things like uh, inclusivity and participatory, uh, maybe permissionless participatory nature of these systems. Um, another very important point that I hope sets the stage for the talks today is this interesting question, right? So, so when we talk about governance in the context of blockchain, there's two very, very different angles on it. There's the idea of governance of blockchain and governance by blockchain. There's a really incredible researcher named Primavera de Filippi who has done a lot of really just mind-blowingly excellent work on, on governance in general, on blockchain governance. I very strongly encourage you to Google her, read some of her um, papers and, and watch some of her talks. She's spoken very eloquently about this topic. Um, Governance of blockchain is how do we govern the blockchain itself, right? And that's kind of what I showed you a moment ago um, when I was talking about what we're governing. Governance by blockchain is a much bigger idea, which is that once we figure out how to govern these blockchains, 
then we can use them to govern things in the real world, right? Maybe they offer an alternative to some of our existing institutions and governance structures, whether it's monetary, whether it's, um, you know, ways to build better democracies, a lot of the ideas that are being explored in the radical exchange community, things like that. But for the purposes of today, um, we're going to be focusing primarily on governance of blockchain, right? So how do we govern these complex projects? And my personal goal was that, you know, hopefully we come back a year from now and we figured out how to govern blockchains and then we can begin using blockchains to govern the world using projects like Democracy Earth, which is Santi's project. So shout out to Democracy Earth. Yeah, that was, that was executed uh, with precision. Um, all right, cool. So let's just try to talk about some very basic terminology. I, there's a lot here and I have very limited time. I'm not going to go through everything, but this is just the core, most important concepts um, that I think you're going to hear brought up today. So very, very, very briefly, Incentivization is a big part of governance. Um, you know, how do we incentivize people to vote, to participate, uh, to have skin in the game? How, you know, in the context of blockchain, are we offering block rewards or validator rewards or something like that? Um, legitimacy and authority are just really core, essential questions in any system of governance. What is kind of the source of legitimacy, right? Why do we believe that in the context of, I mean, my home country, the United States, right? Why do we vest power in the Supreme Court? Why do we vest power in the office of president or in, in the Congress? Um, what is the source of that? Is it the Constitution? Is it a set of shared values? Is it something else? Um, what gives those, those institutions authority? And what does it mean for them to have authority and execute authority? Um, transparency, accountability, you know, they're fairly self-explanatory, but accountability is really, really essential in governance as well. So I would say a, a property of most good governance systems is that they are accountable. And no individual, no government, governmental mechanism or body is, is above uh, accountability. Everyone's accountable to someone else, right? And that's what the system of checks and balances means. And I think that that's a very essential characteristic. So I mentioned checks and balances, right? Kind of different folks, different mechanisms, <laughs> keeping each other in check, balancing power. Um, Stakeholder, this is a very controversial, contentious kind of question. Who is a stakeholder? Is it just people who have a seat at the table? Is it people who are directly impacted by governance? Is it people who are indirectly impacted by governance? Again, in the context of Ethereum, um, Vlad Zamfir, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with, who has you know, a lot to say on this topic, um, has suggested that sort of all human beings you know, alive today and at any point in the future are potentially stakeholders in Ethereum governance. Because, you know, to, to the extent that Ethereum becomes a network that you know, governments are built on or that's used to govern things off the blockchain or that money is built on, um, you know, it's a very expansive definition of stakeholder and so people have a much more narrow definition. Uh, this concept of on and off-chain governance, so very, very briefly on-chain governance means um, when we, we make decisions uh, in, you know, through the protocol and they're implemented or enacted on-chain uh, this, could, this takes different forms, like coin voting. Tezos is a very um, maximal version of this. You can hear more about Tezos today. Off-chain governance is the old-fashioned type of governance with, with meat space, you know, people having conversations online or in person. Uh, this is tightly, closely related to a, a concept called tightly coupled or loosely coupled, which is also related to binding versus non-binding governance. Uh, Vitalik has a good article on a lot of this stuff. But again, just this question of like, when we make decisions, do they um, take effect immediately, or is there some interpretation layer around those decisions? Um, we have signaling and voting rights, so signaling is generally regarded as non-binding. It's just a, a signaling input into another governance mechanism versus voting, which um, should be binding. And I think if you look at like what's happening with Brexit today, it's a very interesting question. There was a vote, you know, and, and there was a single vote. And, uh, you know, is it the case that the government and the entire, all the citizens of the United Kingdom should be bound by that vote? Uh, or should there be another vote, right? Is it binding or non-binding? Um, formal, informal governance. Um, we have a lot of informal governance in networks like Ethereum and Bitcoin today, um, where decisions get made in some kind of complex ways that aren't super well documented and understood versus more formal systems where we have, you know, legislative bodies and, and election processes. Um, you'll probably hear a lot today about different types of forks, hard forks, soft forks. Uh, they can be contentious or uncontentious. We have this concept of like a user-activated soft fork in Bitcoin. Uh, and finally, an idea I really, really like, which is wet code and dry code. This is an idea that comes from Nick Salvo, um, who is a, a legal scholar and a computer scientist. Uh, he's the person who invented the concept of a smart contract as well. Um, and uh, so he proposes this idea, right? Wet code is code that is interpreted by the human brain. 
right? So that's like legal code in that respect of the word. Dry code, on the other hand, is code that's interpreted by machines. And so there's this very interesting balance here between these two different types of code and how they interact in the context of blockchains, which we can talk about for hours. It's super interesting. Uh, Shruti's going to come up and join us and share a bit on her work on systemic governance. It's a super interesting and important topic. Introduce yourself as well. Hello, I'm uh, Shruti. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I'm Shruti Abhya. I'm a crypto economics oh. researcher. And uh, I, I, I bring to this space of blockchain all the concepts that I've um, um, thought about in the field of complex systems. So I'm going to talk about um, governance as a means of coordinating multiple agents within a system. And there's this concept of guided self-organization, which is basically when you allow agents to evolve by themselves and to govern by themselves, but you guide it a little bit so that, that, so that, the, so that, so that they end up in a desirable state in easier manner. There are several ways in which you can actually guide these agents. So um, the first way is through, through interrupts, and then the second way is through the design of the dynamics of the system itself, so by implementing some sort of systemic control. And then the third way is by uh, constraining the structure of the entire governance system. So I'm going to um, kind of mathematically characterize this so that it will be easier for you to grasp. Um, okay, cool. Um, all right, so interrupts. Who has, who here has played with um, uh, Arduinos? Show of hands. Okay, cool, so then you might, might be familiar with interrupts. It's basically this piece of code that whenever something goes wrong within the system, or if the Arduino is running out of processing power, then that co code will come in and it will modify uh, a certain parameter. So, so basically, uh, interrupts is just when you want to change for example, if you have this uh, control variable x, then you change it to x prime, so that you put it in, you put the system in a more desirable state. So, for example, if your system gets stuck in a local minima like this, uh, actually, okay. if your system gets stuck in a local minima, <coughs> and say this is x, uh, basically you you go and intervene into the system to put this back here. So that it's a, it's in a more desirable state, and then the governance can just happen from from there on. So that the agents can just uh, coordinate themselves from there on. So then you have the problem of, or or another way of guiding the self-organizing system using systemic control. So this is when um, you don't just change the parameter; you change the function that controls the parameter. So you change f of x to f of x prime, or f prime x. So instead of changing or moving this point to here, you change the function itself. So if you had an initial function that looked like this, you can make the new function look like this, or any, any kind of functional modification. This is usually manifested as hard forks on the blockchain. And then you can have um, entire digital constitutions So this is when you want to change the entire structure in which the government governance is operating under. So you can go from a democracy to oligar oligarchy or anything of that sort. And this is, some, this is when you predefine the structure of the governance itself. So now you're changing the entire set of governance policies that is defined by F1x, F2x, all until Fnx of all of the policies that determine or underlie the entire governance mechanism. So you change it to G prime. So this will become basically all of the different st sets of functions in which it's moderating under, and then you, you basically transform it to things like this. So, so that is, that although it creates a huge amount of change, you can see how limiting that is. So basically, um, in, in the whole field of complex systems, you have this um, you have this phenomenon of self-organization, where you allow the agents to govern themselves so that you can observe emergent effects. Um, however, if you if you go ahead and if you um, change the digital constitution itself, you are guiding the system too much in such a way that the governance of that system or the the behavior of that system will be too constrained or too limited in order to for you to actually observe any emergent effects. 
So although that's high impact, it's highly <coughs> limiting and highly constraining itself also. Uh, systemic control is kind of in the medium level. It has some executional challenges. So the executional challenges with systemic control is that it requires a lot of coordination amongst agents to you know, arrive at a consensus for you know, executing a hard fork. Uh, whereas with interrupts, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very low impact, but at the same time, it will, it will definitely create a, a change within the system. But it's, at the same time, it's also um, highly flexible in such a way that you will be able to observe emergent effects even if you do change the interrupts or if you change the control parameters. So uh, those are the three ways in which you can uh, mathematically think of um, how to guide self-organizing systems. And um, I think that next link we'll be talking about the different ways in which um, constitutions can, or structures of governments can be, um, can be um, designed within self-organizing systems. Thank you, Shiti. And you're going to do a talk, I think, later today, right? So we can dive more into this with you later? Yeah. Okay, cool. So make sure not to miss that. There's um, an enormous amount that we can learn from researchers such as Shruti who are exploring these ideas of network theory and systems theory and complex systems. I've just tiptoed into this space myself and I encourage all of you to do the same. Uh, check out this article. Is this your article here, Shruti? That's, I think, Vitalik's article okay. on digital constitutions. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to end this talk, um, but I wanted to just show you guys a brief snapshot of what the rest of the day looks like. So up next, we, up next, we have a talk from Fede, who's going to talk about the history of democracy and random selection, which is really exciting. Um, you'll hear about history of blockchain governance. Uh, John, I don't know if that's an okay title. I think I may have thrown that up there, but is that accurate? Yeah, my, my okay. presentation approximates that. Sweet. So that's approximately right. And we have a bunch of uh, sort of lightning talks on the different protocols, and then we'll kind of conclude um, with a few more talks uh, from Shruti and Kate, um, Ilya and myself. And uh, so my understanding is that um, this session officially ends at 12, but there's nothing here after this, and the venue is open until 2 p.m. So um, I'm happy to stick around, and anyone else who can stick around, we can go a little over time, and maybe we can do a panel or something. Um, so feel free to go out, grab lunch, come back if you're interested in sticking around. Uh, I'm out of time, so I'm going to put this on hold for now. Um, let's continue with the other talks, and if we have any more time later, then I'm happy to share more on Ethereum governance with everybody. Okay? Thank you very much for listening. Hello, how are you? Um, so good to see so many friends here. Um, while the good kind of stuff are being sorted, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Federico. I'm CEO at Kleros. Uh, we do decentralized courts. Uh, but I'm not going to speak about this now. Um, I'm going to speak about this later. What I'm going to speak about now is uh, some the, of the ideas on which Kleros is based, which is random selection. Right? So how, um, when we think about blockchain governance, we have to think that we are thinking about governance. And humans had to solve governance problems for basically centuries and millennia right now. Um, and one of the key um, features of early day republics was that they were based on random selection of people for different uh, offices. So it is OK? The internet is very slow. It's loading slowly, okay. but it, yeah, it'll be okay. So about my background, I'm uh, studied economics, political philosophy, then I did a PhD in collective intelligence, and this is like what brought me to, to this type of uh, topics. Uh, so let's conclude. The question to, to start is if rationality is always a good thing for making decisions, right? We tend to think that rationality is a good thing for making decisions, but there are some times where uh, reasons can be very bad, like when there is racism or some groups that try to uh, just move forward their own interests. Um, and what randomness makes is that you have a pool of options, and the option that is going to be chosen is not going to be chosen because of reasons. It's going to be chosen because of randomness. So any of those will be, can be um, selected. And so uh, the blend break, what it introduces is the uh, break of um, what is called irrationality, a non-rational decision in the selection process. This means that a lottery decision is going to be uh, impartial, it's going to be amoral, uh, and a lot of different things um, that um, may be uh, important for, for some political systems, um, especially uh, when 
we fear that bad reasons may be used to make a decision. So this is what's called the lottery principle. Uh, you may want to consider lotteries when uh, you fear that some bad reason could interfere in a, in a decision in process, right? So, we spend a lot of time in blockchain governance debates about what is the best way to create a voting system, like quadratic, like X voting system. In the end, it's a question of how we aggregate preferences. So, voting is a process that is based on reasons which may be good or bad. And uh, lotteries is a process that is based not on reasons, right? And this excludes both good and bad reasons. Um, so let's see now a bit of um, some examples of how this has been used in the history of, of political systems. Um, because, you know, um, we sometimes think that we are inventing stuff, but we are just rediscovering things that have been worked for working for a long time in different uh, regimes. <coughs> so, who knows this guy? <laughs> so, this guy is the guy who uh, created what we know as ancient Greek democracy. You know, there was this dictator called Hippias. He overthrew uh, the Hippias regime, leading a popular rebellion, and then he created what we know as the Greek democracy, the, the assembly, uh, and how people vote, etc. And you know what he did after doing these reforms? Yeah, of course, but anyone should do it disappear. And so no one knows what, where he went, uh, but the thing is that he created the system and then left it for the citizens to, to manage it. So you know who did that, right? So um, this is a basic structure of the ancient Greek system. Citizens can participate in the assembly. All of them are allowed, provided they are, like, of course, male and not slaves. And the assembly is going to choose courts, council, and magistrates. And look how important was random selection in, the, in choosing people for public office. Look, so the percent of all the people who were in public office were chosen by lot. And only 1% chosen by election. Uh, only those like, who were in very high levels in the army, generals, were chosen by lot. <coughs> because it requires very specialized knowledge. So, the council chose, the assembly chose 500 citizens selected by lot, and every year it rotated the council. was charged, was like the executive power, it was in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the police. And they had this really uh, specific selection process. You know what this is? A pinakion. It's a Greek ID token. Each citizen had one of these with their name on it, uh, and uh, if, when there was the day of the lottery process, they went to the lottery machine, you know how it's called? <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking to Sandy for years about this machine, but, and this is a machine that they use for random selection. You went you, with your token, it's like a bronze plate, and decide to put this into a slot into the, into the machine, and then came some guy from the political process and put some uh, white and black dice into the machine, but you are fixed on the side, and they have like this, uh, I have the, the logo <laughs> here, but it's like icosahedron dice, 20 face dice, and if you had on your row uh, white dice, you were selected, black dice, you went home. And this is where the uh, council met. So why, why was this used, uh, why, why, why was this done this way? So, the Athenian had like different families that were struggling for power. And they were very afraid of one of them concentrating too much power uh, into the police, right? So, the uh, um, uh, best way to do this was, okay, instead of making elections which can lead to patronage or can lead to collusion, let's just select them like randomly. And they use this, this method. And on top of that, if there is some, um, even so randomness sometimes can be in favor of someone, it changed every year. So they always rotated. So any potential gain that could be done in the short term by some very lucky uh, random selection was then destroyed the next year when it changed all over again. So the two keys of the Greek democracy were random selection and rotation. If you want to learn more about how this process works, I highly recommend this classical <laughs> book about <laughs> the 
uh, yeah, headlamp is uh, the classical looks is from the 1930s. And if you want to learn more about how the whole political system worked uh, in Greece, um, this great book by Josiah Ober, Russian Knowledge, is how everything, and a lot of the things that we are discussing in blockchain governance, you know, these guys knew already. Okay, let's move forward um, some, some time to the Renaissance, and another important um, city where there was a high use of competition was, um, was Venice. You know, Venice was a trading empire, and it was known as the Repubblica Serenissima. Why is that? Because the most serene republic was intended to give all the merchants of the Middle Ages, or of the Renaissance, the confidence that rule of law was uh, enacted there, right? Remember Shylock's Merchant of Venice? There is a trial scene, and in the trial scene, the, the judge says, okay, well, I know that this contract is not cool, a pound of flesh, but a contract is a contract. <laughs> and if we don't comply with contracts, no one is going to come to Venice to trade, right? So the thing is that this image of Venice as some very strict rule of law place, a very like, serene place, was built on top of like a land powder, like, arsenal. Because it, the social structure were, again, of some families that were struggling for power. And these families, you know what, they had private armies, and they hated each other, you know? So <laughs> they had to find a way for these guys to like, coexist in peace in, in Venice, and preserve the rule of law that was very important for all of them to prosper from trade. Um, you know this painting from, you know who painted this one? Canaletto. And what is this building? Who went to Venice? <laughs> yes, Palazzo Ducale. The Palazzo Ducale. And who, who lived there, of course, the Doge of Venice. <laughs> the most famous uh, Doge, the Doge was the president of the Venetian Republic. And the, the interesting thing about the Doge is that most of the political positions, most of the office were uh, selected by lot in Venice. But the Doge selection process was very specific. Yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit about this. So this is how it, it is described. That tank is uh, like the, the uh, it's like a blueprint for how you select the Doge. And it started uh, in the Concilio Grande. This is uh, one, uh, 1,000 people, like one, the patricians who participate here. It was in the Palazzo Ducale. And then um, you had lot selection of all the 1,000 people, 30 members selected there. And all these 30 guys went to a different room and draw again by lot only nine of them. So this nine, then went on to voting to nominate 40 members out of all the 1,000 members, and they did at least seven votes apiece. So these 40 members, they went to a different room, and then they selected by lot 12 members, right? And these 12 members, do so you think it ends here? No. <laughs> <laughs> these 12 members selected 25 members by voting. And you know what these 25 guys did? They selected nine members out of the 25 by lot. And these nine members then nominated 45 members by voting, and these 45 members drew 11 of them by lot. And these 11 were called the Undici, and the Undici uh, nominated by voting 41 members. And the 41 members, you know what they did? <laughs> they selected the dog. <laughs> so this was the extremely highly sophisticated random selection process that they had in the Republic of Venice to make sure that no one would tamper with the process, right? <laughs> it was like a shuffling machine of, of people, right, you know? Um, and the problem they had in Venice was that you don't want people to run for office. You want the office to select your man that should have it, right? Um, and this made politics a non-attractive career for people because they, you could do nothing to become the dodge. It was so random that you could not like try to create your alliances. And, and the, the random selection also gave all the families the chance to rotate in the dodge. So this time is you, this time is you, and so it, it rotated. And this created like peace among, among them, right? If you want to learn more about how the process works and the mathematics behind it, 
Uh, there's this very good research paper from Juliet Packard. I don't know why they research <laughs> the selection, but who knows? And these guys, and the thesis is that the Doge election process, uh, okay, I'm sorry, you, you were taking a picture. <laughs> they, call, they call that um, security theater. Okay, when you are a merchant and you are thinking of Venice as a good place to do business, when you see that they have this very sophisticated process, then you can trust that the rule of law will stay, right? So this is what they call a security theater. Even if the process didn't very work, work very well, it still gave the impression that these guys knew what they were doing in politics. If you want to learn more about the Renaissance and sortition, I'm not going to delve into this because of time, but Machiavelli, whom we all know from the prince, he, in his discourses on living, he was a Republican. Like everything he, did, he wrote of the prince is contrary to what he actually did as a politician. He was a Republican and he believed strongly in people having the right to government and he used the use of randomness um, in the election. Um, and so this takes us to the United States. The partition was an important part of the discussions in the time of the early days of the country. So, you know, they overthrew the English rule and now they have to figure out how they create a state for, uh, that works, basically, the first time ever at large-scale democracy. And we have, like, these guys, um, the Federalists, were basically intellectuals, politicians writing on, okay, how should the US work? How should the political system work? Should we have a president, a king, um, like a congress, two chambers, one chamber, all these questions they wrote in the Federalist papers. Um, and um, there is one guy, one guy that is not that very well known. It is well known, but not as much as the others, and it's called Thomas Paine. And this guy, among other things, he um, created the, um, uh, some ideas based on universal income are based in some writings from him, an agrarian society. And he uh, suggested a method of uh, selecting the president in order to avoid that the federal government would be captured by the elites of the powerful colonies. So this is what he suggested. Um, the, the colonies would choose delegates to send to Congress, and then when Congress started, they would select by lot one colony out of the 13, and then um, those 13 members from that colony would choose one member who would be president for one year, right? Uh, so this is what he suggested because he was thinking of how the Greek did it, right? The rotation plus random selection would tend to break consideration of power. Um, and then this is the last time that sortition was really discussed uh, on a serious level. It didn't pass, of course, as you know. And then it declined. Why did sortition decline uh, in the political thought history? Because of two reasons. One, because luck, luck started to be seen as an application of responsibility. Like, if you like, throwing a dice looks, started to look like, more like gambling than, than to like some legitimate way to select uh, people for office. <coughs> and also, because the classical idea of the republic, of the people like um, working for the common good, fell. And what we have is liberal democracies where you have like, people selecting some representative and this guy governing for a couple of years and then the people selecting again uh, another, like giving them more time if they did well and, or housing them of government if they didn't do well. So um, this ended in what we know as the partisan politics. And that's exactly what the ancient wanted to avoid when they used the sortition. So the ancient Greek wouldn't recognize our systems are as a republic, right? Um, these days, there is a movement that is um, bringing back the early ideas of sortition. If you want to learn more, these are called the Clarotarians. You know, Helen Lademore, uh, is the French one, she's uh, great. She's, uh, but these guys are writing about this. And how this works today is um, you have um, what they call mini publics. You select a number of people for uh, from the citizens, and then these guys, uh, they're selected randomly, and they are consulted in policy making, right? They are actually doing one of these in France now. Hélène Landemore is leading this, and this is for making policy for climate change. And this just took <coughs> place like last week. Um, and then the thing is that, uh, 
all these ideas of sortition and how to create um, these uh, political processes that are more uh, transparent and less um, yeah, prone to, to pollution are very likely to pass in existing democracies now. But the thing is that we have the chance, since we, are, we don't have to reform all legacy regimes, I, we have the chance of, like, when we overthrow these monarchies as the US did in the 18th century, we can't build the institutions that we, that we need to build for the coming time of the internet to be, uh, yeah, to be better governed. And so this is the blockchain uh, thing. So we're building these institutions and we can choose uh, whatever we want because there are no limits now, right? No, no legacy to reform. So um, I think that sortition can be a really good way to do it and how we should think about this. Well, when do we want reasons to be part of the uh, decisions? When we see that there is a very high chance of bad reasons becoming part of the decision, uh, then let's use sortition. So we sanitize those bad reasons. Uh, when we want people to express their preferences and we don't see the possibility of bad reasons being important, then yes, we can uh, use traditional voting systems and quadratic or whatever is to be discussed. So um, you want to learn more about this idea? <coughs> the, the, there are like two bibles of random selection. One of them is The Luck of the Draw by Peter Stone, a professor at the University of Dublin. Uh, this is great. And the other one is Oliver Dolan, The Political Political Tradition, and this is a history of how random selection was used throughout the history of politics. And well, we can learn a lot from this. Uh, so thank you very much. And yeah, hope that helps to take a lot I learned a ton from that talk. Uh, John, I think you're up next. Are you using your laptop? Uh, I sent you slides. Oh boy, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll download them. It might take a minute. It's like five Introduce yourself. Cool. So yeah, um, thank you all for coming uh, so early on Friday, uh, but last day of DEF um, this, this week was great. Um, so my name is John Light. Um, I work on governance uh, for the Aragon Network. And I'll be giving a presentation about that uh, a little bit later. But um, my talk this morning is about a brief history of blockchain governance. So uh, this, is, this, as the title implies, this is by no means going to be comprehensive. Um, although blockchains have only been around for 10 years, uh, 10 odd years, um, there's been a lot of really interesting uh, events as it relates to governance in uh, different blockchain networks. And so I'm going to cover uh, just a brief selection of uh, some events that have stood out to me over the years. But again, this is by no means comprehensive. We could probably talk about this um, all day. So uh, thank you, Wayne. Um, with, do you need a picture? A good picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with the first slide, that's a good one. Okay. All right. um, So um, the, the first one I'll cover um, was uh, the CVE uh, 2010 uh, 5139 soft fork in August of 2010. Um, so this was a bug in Bitcoin that caused about 80, 184 billion Bitcoin to be created. Um, basically someone just exploited this bug to create some transactions that um, created you know, all these uh, Bitcoin out of thin air. And people noticed this and were understandably alarmed. And uh, a, a, a patch was quickly developed and circulated in the community. Uh, Satoshi kind of gave the patch his blessing. And, um, and it was very quickly adopted. Um, a soft fork, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the term, uh, is a fork that restricts the rule set of uh, the consensus rules in, in a blockchain. And, and, and uh, in such a way that it's backwards compatible. So, um, so basically, uh, transactions that are created under the new rule set are compatible with old nodes that have not adopted the new rule set yet. Um, but uh, transactions that violate the new rule set uh, that are created by old nodes are rejected by the new nodes. Um, so basically, it, it, this 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 uh, fork said that 
uh, any transactions that you know create these 184 billion uh, Bitcoin or, or create uh, these uh, overflow uh, transactions are invalid um, and everything else is, is valid. Um, and they basically kind of like rolled back the blockchain to before the um, these uh, big 184 Bitcoin uh, were created, included all of the valid transactions, and then continued on from there. Um, and, and, and this was kind of done in, and again, uh, kind of like uh, a very like, community-driven fashion. Um, uh, so this is the patch uh, that, that Satoshi uh, kind of published and, and put out. And uh, the, the good blockchain pretty quickly overtook the bad blockchain. Um, so then there was the uh, one megabyte uh, block size limit soft fork uh, in 2010, uh, September 2010. So this one was done kind of quietly. Uh, Satoshi didn't really announce it. He just kind of like published uh, this, uh, you know, made this commit in the code base and then pushed it out. People adopted it. Um, it was bundled as a soft fork again, uh, along with some unrelated changes. Um, and then it was scheduled to activate at a specific block height. So once the block height uh, was reached in the blockchain, um, the, the soft fork activated. And uh, from that point forward, no blocks could be created that were bigger than one megabyte. Um, so this was kind of done basically by Satoshi, almost in secret. Um, and this is the exact code where it adds this uh, limit. So you can see that uh, there, you can see if uh, the network height is greater than uh, 79,400 blocks, then, um, and, and the block size is bigger than the max block size a constant, then um, you, uh, get returned an error. Um, but yeah, this was done kind of surreptitiously. Satoshi did this a couple of times too. He, he just kind of like slipped in consensus uh, rule changes um, so that it wouldn't be too controversial and they wouldn't have to, you know, kind of debate it. <laughs> um, so, the, so then there was a proposal to increase the block size limit because people were like, this isn't going to scale. So of course, once the block size limit was activated, uh, you could, people could then kind of talk about it in public and so Jeff Garza comes along and he said he introduces a patch that would enable Bitcoin to miners to uh, produce, as a typo, produce valid blocks larger than one megabyte. And uh, the community kind of pushes back and says, hey, people don't like download the, or install the patch. You're going to become incompatible with the network because it would be a hard fork at that point. It wouldn't be backwards compatible. And so the network would split if basically everybody did not uh, install it at the same time. Uh, Satoshi kind of also uh, pushes back on the idea. You know, Satoshi says, um, you know, this, this is going to make you incompatible with the network, don't run it. Um, but here's how it could be done. However, it, it was never done the way that Satoshi uh, suggested it. And so uh, the one megabyte uh, limit uh, persisted for quite some time. And we'll talk about how that's affected Bitcoin over the years. So here's you know, Jeff Garzik's post uh, saying, like, oh, this is how we could do it. Um, and then Satoshi is like, uh, don't use this patch. Um, you, if, if you install it, you will make yourself incompatible with the network to your own detriment. Uh, we can phase in the change later, of course, uh, if we get closer to needing it. Um, so then there was the uh, BIP30 soft fork. Again, a soft fork. Um, whereas before, Satoshi would activate it by block height, this one was activated by kind of a flag day. So, uh, it was based on the timestamp that a block was created rather than the exact block height. Um, BIP30, um, I think this was basically a change that prevented uh, two transactions from having the same transaction ID, with the exception of two specific blocks that they didn't want to have to like revert a, a, a transaction that was confirmed in the past. But uh, from after BIP30 uh, was activated, from that point forward, two transactions uh, could no longer have the same transaction ID. Um, and, and so this was activated on a specific day. Um, and it says uh, right here, like this rule applies to all blocks whose timestamp is after March 15, 2012 at 00 UTC. Um, and that was uh, published by Peter Guilla. Um So then there was the BIP50 hard fork uh, in 2013. You'll notice most of this is Bitcoin because like Bitcoin was really the only coin of significance at this point. Um, sorry to altcoins. Uh, so then there was a BIP50 hard fork in uh, 2013, uh, uh, March 2013. So this was kind of the first like big 
uh, bug when, when Bitcoin was really worth uh, a lot in value. Like this was a, around the time that Bitcoin shot up to like 150, 200 dollars, something like that. Um, and so it was happening in a lot of like in the middle of a lot of like price drama. Um, Bit50 at uh, uh, there was a there was a bug um, called the kind of Berkeley DB bug that caused a chain split. It was the longest uh, chain split in Bitcoin's history so far. Um, uh, that like accidental chain split. Um, and then Bit50 was kind of activated on the Bitcoin network using a flag day hard fork, um, which, which, which created uh, a basically backwards incompatible change um, to, to fix this Berkeley DB bug. Um, and like here's the code to do that uh, once again. Um, you have this uh, like rule where like, you know, if uh, the block time is greater than one, uh, whatever this time is, 11 March 2013, then you implement this rule, and then after uh, May 15th, we'll actually, uh, we'll actually relax the rule. And so when they relax the rule, that was a hard fork, um, because uh, basically any, anything created after that point was incompatible with uh, software that was running before that point. So it's technically a hard fork, although some people might debate whether that was actually a hard fork. Um, so then there was a really interesting um, event in a coin called Faircoin. Uh, it's the first uh, rollback that I know of that actually kind of like was was almost like a a a, a uh, kind of like uh, a justice related uh, rollback. So basically, there was an exchange called MinPal that was hacked, and 30% of the Faircoin supply was stolen. Now Faircoin was a proof of stake coin, so if 30% of your proof of stake coin is held by somebody with perhaps less than good intentions, well, your blockchain's in trouble. So they decided, you know, we're going to roll back the blockchain and reverse the theft transactions. Now, this was very controversial in the Veracoin community. Um, and has anyone ever heard of Veracoin? Uh, we can see how, you know, successful that has made the blockchain. Um, but, but in any case, you know, a lot of people did think that it was a good idea because, again, 30% of your coins in a proof of stake blockchain being held by an attacker is maybe not the best thing. So I thought that was really interesting. It was the earliest kind of example that I could find of a, of a kind of like you know, reversal of a theft rather than a kind of fixing of a bug the way the earlier buffer overflow um, rollback was, was done in Bitcoin. So then, uh, moving back to Bitcoin, BIP 101 was added to Bitcoin XT. So Bitcoin XT, uh, the, the main uh, Bitcoin client in the Bitcoin network uh, today and back then uh, is called Bitcoin QT or Bitcoin Core. This was the a, a derivative of, or I should say descendant of the, um, the client that Satoshi, uh, Satoshi himself wrote. Um, Bitcoin XT was developed by a different development team. So a former Bitcoin Core developer named Mike Hearn uh, had this client called Bitcoin XT that he was doing some experimental stuff with. And then uh, there was a, a BIP or a Bitcoin Improvement Proposal uh, 101 that was implemented to increase the block size to 8 megabytes. Uh, now Bitcoin Core did not adopt this BIP. Uh, it would have been a hard fork and, and they were against a hard fork to increase the block size limit at that point. Uh, but there was some movement uh, within the Bitcoin community to increase the block size limit. And so Bitcoin XT implemented this um, and, and was basically trying to convince people, hey, uh, you know, Bitcoin Core isn't responding to the community's demands for an increase in the block size limit, you should run Bitcoin XT instead. And so this was kind of one of the first examples of a, a Bitcoin client kind of going rogue and, and going against uh, consensus in, in the Bitcoin network. Um, so later in 2015, uh, miners and businesses were signaling support for bigger blo blocks. So mining pool operators like signed a letter uh, saying, you know, we all support up to eight megabytes or even 20 megabyte blocks in June. Um, and then uh, prominent businesses kind of did something similar. Uh, a bunch of uh, popular uh, Bitcoin wallets and payment processors and such uh, uh, also signed the letter saying, you know, we support BIP 101 or eight megabyte. Uh, block size limit. Um, this is what the, the minor letter looks like. Uh, you can see Ftpool, uh, Ampool, Huobi, and uh, there's a BW and a, kind of a date stamp uh, there. Um, they represented a pretty significant share of the hash power of the network. 
um, and then also um, uh, blockchain, uh, BitPay, and a bunch of other businesses signed this uh, industry letter also supporting bigger blocks. Um, nothing really became of this. <laughs> Uh, because the Bitcoin network has started to change. Okay. So uh, in 2015, August 2015, uh, the DashDAO goes live. So I think this was perhaps the first example of a blockchain that basically like took a, a portion of the block reward, uh, so the new coins that were being generated, and then gave it to a specific kind of entity and said like, do, do what you will with this. And that specific entity was a network of what are called master nodes, which are uh, Dash, uh, nodes in the Dash network that have locked 1,000 Dash tokens in their wallet. Uh, once they've done this, then they get uh, voting rights to vote on how these, uh, this portion of the block reward that has been split off gets, gets spent. Um, fast forward to uh, uh, July of 2016, Ethereum splits after the DAO incident. Uh, so basically here, um, uh, you know, someone figured out that they could like unilaterally unilaterally withdraw money from the DAO, uh, which was a smart contract on Ethereum, uh, that they did not deposit. And they used this to try to drain like most of the money out of the DAO. Um, the Ethereum network reacted uh, by basically creating a hard fork that was trying to reverse this change, um, uh, or like reverse this event. Um, and uh, the, the network ended up splitting into what we call Ethereum today, which was a new Ethereum chain where the funds were returned to the original owners. And then Ethereum Classic, uh, which which uh, you know, was at the time you know the original chain where the 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 person who originally you know, tried to withdraw money from the DAO actually got the money, um, and and on the Ethereum Classic chain that that history is still preserved uh, today. Um, so then in 2017 there was the the block size debate in, in Bitcoin was kind of coming to a head. Um, there were there were kind of like three main competing proposals. Uh, at various points in time throughout the year. One was called SegWit, UASF, or User Activated Soft Fork. One was a BCH, or, or a Bitcoin Cash. And the other was a SegWit 2X. And these were all backed by various factions of the community. Um, so a seg the story here is that SegWit, uh, which was a change in Bitcoin uh, that fixed transaction malleability and, and also happened to increase uh, the block weight limit to four megabytes. Um, was originally intended to be activated by a miner activated soft fork. Uh, so basically the idea was that miners would signal up to like, I think it was 70% uh, uh, support, and once it got to 70% support, the, the change would activate. Well, SegWit failed to gather enough support from miners, uh, so Bitcoin users decided to activate SegWit themselves. Basically they would run software that says at a certain block height or whatever, uh, we will start rejecting any blocks that don't conform to SegWit. Sorry, miners. Um, SegWit 2X uh, was a group of folks that pr proposed a compromise. But we will increase the block size limit, like double the block size limit, and implement SegWit. Everybody gets what they want. Uh, well, that didn't work out. Um, when, the, when, the, when it was looking like the user activated software was actually gaining momentum and was going to get activated, some miners that felt threatened by this decided to uh, just create their own hard fork to increase the block size limit without SegWit and uh, created this uh, new coin that we now call Bitcoin Cash, or BCH. Um, and now with uh, a new chain that had you know, more, a bigger block size limit and SegWit activated through a user activated soft fork, a set, the, the wind was completely taken out of SegWit 2X's sales and the SegWit 2X fork was eventually abandoned by uh, the people who uh, originally proposed it. Uh, like, two more slides. So, uh, DAC, uh, Decred, uh, then uh, in, in 20, uh, June of 2017, uh, activates its first upgrade uh, using a, an on-chain governance mechanism. So, uh, this was a way that uh, basically what are called like ticket hole cred blockchain could vote on a change to the consensus rules and then but just by voting, uh, the, the consensus rules would actually be changed automatically. People didn't have to upgrade their clients. Their clients would just recognize, oh, this is the way that ticket holders voted. These are the changes. I'm automatically going to uh, kind of accept these upgrades. Um, so this is kind of the first example of successful like, on-chain governance in action. Uh, or like on-chain tightly coupled uh, governance over the consensus rules specifically. Um, and then, 
uh, most recently, fast forward to June 2018, um, EOS was launched. Uh, it was launched. Uh, they, they, they also have this idea of like on chain governance over consensus rules. Um, they launched with like a constitution that was intended to bind how these uh, rules would change. And of course, uh, block producers who are like the equivalent of miners uh, immediately violate the constitution. Uh, they, they decided to uh, unilaterally uh, freeze uh, some accounts that had been identified as potential scammers um, in violation of the EOS constitution, which had actually intended for that kind of action to be taken by a separate arbitration body. Um, so they kind of like routed around the Constitution to, to, to extra legally, uh, you know, impose justice in this case. Um, uh, once again, uh, fast forwarding to April 2019, earlier this year, illegal, uh, EOS kind of illegally scraps their Constitution for a new user agreement. Uh, the reason why, uh, you know, it's characterized as illegal is because, um, they adopted this new user agreement with only 1.74% turnout, despite the fact that their constitution actually required them to have a 15% turnout to make this kind of change. So, uh, so far, um, you know, the blockchain governance is not going so well for, for, for EOS. Um, and this is the end of uh, my presentation, because we're in 2019 now, and there hasn't been anything uh, like incredibly uh, new or, or novel uh, that's happened since then. Uh, so with that, uh, I will end the presentation. Thank you all. Great, right, which, which happened quite recently, and I think we'll hear more from Tezos later today. That was this year. Yeah, yeah, I think the reason why uh, Tezos wasn't included is, is because um, it, it's, while a, certainly a landmark uh, event in itself, it wasn't the first time that that had ever happened. So. Okay, yeah. valid point. Sweet. Uh, we have Alfonso up next speaking about, hey Alfonso, also speaking about um, Polkadot governance. So this is the first um, of our lightning talks, uh, and, and from this point forward we're going to hear a series of talks uh, to learn and do a little bit of a deep dive on uh, a bunch of different protocols. So we'll go ahead and get set up. Yeah. Hi everybody. Um, so I have 10 minutes to present a little bit about the governance of Polkadot. My name is Alfonso Ceballos, so I'm a computer scientist and mathematician by trade. I've been working in things related to optimizing algorithms and also game theory, and I'm also working in the governance topic. Uh, so here's the overview. Um, the governance of is based in stakeholder voting or coin voting. Um, so it's it's not perfect, but it's the best we have, I would say. Uh, some of the problems that people like to point out with uh, coin voting is that there's usually low turnout. Uh, it's, it's a slow governance, and it tends to be a plutocracy. It tends to give power to people with a lot of coins. So I'm going to present ways in which we uh, combat these problems. Um, so stakeholding voting. Um, we're going to use time blocks, which means that it matters not only how much, how many coins you have, but also how long you're willing to lock these uh, coins, because that shows that you are actual, you are very much committed to the system. Um, we have several governance bodies that has some advantages. Uh, the first one is that it increases speed because there are more channels to decision making, and the second is that there are more checks and balances because they can uh, check each other. And we try to give power to minorities, and we obtain that uh, in two ways. One is proportional representation, making sure that minorities are as well represented as possible. And the second is enactment delay. I will say more about that later. So who are the stakeholders? Um, I hope you are aware with Polkadot, uh, because it's quite complex and I don't have time to go into it. But uh, there are validators, they are the ones that run the consensus protocol. There are nominators that are uh, coin holders who support the election validators and they get rewarded to play with the validators. And there are parachains. Parachains also have to hold dots because they need that to secure a, a parachain slot. So the parachain slots are going to be given out uh, at least some of them are going to be give, given out uh, through um, 
just action. <coughs> um, okay, and there are also, of course, investors, there are holders, and there are only coin holders. And I would like to point out that the first ones are locked, the second ones are liquid. And we want to give a bit more voice to the, the ones that are, that are locked, because, as I said, people with locks, they have more uh, skin in the game. And we can trust that they will, they're going to care more about the future uh, of the network. OK, so decision making and governance is going to be based in the referendum. They are going to be, there's going to be one referendum about once a month. And the timeline goes like this. Uh, there's a public proposal. Anybody is free to propose. There's uh, sponsored proposals, so any coin holder can sponsor a proposal that they like, and then once a month we're gonna take the most popular proposal and raise it to referendum. Um, there's gonna be a voting period of one month, and there's gonna be the enactment delay. That is the time between uh, deciding something, deciding a proposal, and actually uh, implementing it. And this is important because it gives power to people who didn't agree with it to actually leave the system. So that they know that something is gonna take place in two weeks, so they could decide to, to sell their dogs if they don't like it. So this is some protection for okay, this gives some protection to adult holders. Um, there's a voluntary time block. So everybody who votes and wins has to lock the, the coins with which they voted. Uh, for at least weeks, for at least a longer period. But if they decide to lock for a longer period, then they get uh, a higher vote. Uh, okay, so I'm running out of time, but I'm going a bit faster. There's the, uh, this body called Council. Uh, it's going to be elected by stakeholders. Their function is to represent the interests of the stakeholders. And uh, something I want to point out is that the way we elect the Council members is through something called proportional representation, which basically means that if there's 10% of coin holders that have similar interests, uh, then they're guaranteed to be represented by at least 10% of the seats in the council, or the same with 20%, or the same with uh, 5%. Um, and this is very different to some other kind of uh, representation systems where only maybe the two biggest majorities get represented and no one else gets represented. So we really want to stress that to this. Because also this gives checks and balances. Um, because the council has some power and we want to make sure that it represents everybody. And if there is no um, unanimity in the council, then they basically have no power. And that's a good thing. They, it's very hard to, for the council to have super majority and decide on some things. Okay, so here's some nice uh, cool graph that represents this proportional representation. You can imagine that. Uh, every color represents some minority that has some different point of view, and each one of them is going to get one representative in the council. How do I do all the time? Oh, the gentleman over there. <laughs> I'm not tracking your time. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, I would just say um, what the, the council can't stop. Um, can mitigate the controversially dangerous or malicious proposals and can fast track the yeah, important proposals. Um, but as I said, most of the time it doesn't have a lot of power. Um, okay, I think I will stop. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so just brief uh, introduction to Teto. So, a lot of people know, obviously, um, a lot of people are here tonight, so um, it's pretty well known basically what it is. But, Basically, a payroll cloud process of applications has, like, you know, uses um, you know, proof of stake, not deep books, um, and uh, has this multi stage uh, on chain governance mechanism. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to point out at the beginning is that it's also an architectural thing. Uh, it does governance, it's actually that's a meta protocol. Uh, it can technically, um, you know, instantiate any blockchain based protocols, <coughs> theoretically. Um, but uh, basically, uh, Tezos, you know, the underlying, you know, the way that blocks get created and, uh, you know, uh, form consensus is basically uh, through this notion of baking and legal proof of stake. So 
you have um, basically, and that's actually a graph of bakers uh, joining Tezos, um, you know, the first year. Um, obviously, you know, there's a big increase in the, you know, first few months, and then sort of a steady uh, level blowing off. Uh, it's not, it has delegation, uh, so people can, you know, move their stake to, and assign their stake to, um, you know, these various bakers around the world, but it's not DFOS uh, in the notion of, you know, the way of POS or Tron or this or anything like that. Uh, it's all obviously funded by uh, 5.5, there's some, some amount of inflation, but it um, you know, appreciates that. Uh, and so then the Tales Baker ecosystem in practice is actually, you know, it's basically almost 500 uh, validators in about 35 uh, countries, at least that's what we know publicly, you know, not, not all validators state where they are, what they're, um, you know, what they're, what they're doing. Uh, and so you have to sort of, the, the participants in this governance system are basically across many different, uh, you know, they're, they're institutional folks running really complex, uh, you know, cloud-based setups. There's folks on Raspberry Pi, uh, there's folks just with Ledger and Trezor, um, you know, in their, in their basement. Uh, and there's about 110 of these public delegates, uh, um, you know, of these four, you know, four, 450 to 500 of the various, about 110 of them are, are public and, and vote on other people's uh, behalf. Uh, and then you have about uh, in, of the percentage of the network that's involved in this process, about 71% of the digital supply. I think it's about 80% of the activated supply. Uh, and so then, what's the actual process? So it looks, you know, very, um, you know, complex, but it's actually uh, much simpler than that. It's uh, basically it comprises four periods, and some of this is changing uh, potentially in a week if we activate a new, uh, you know, upgrade. Um, but basically, it, it involves. It starts with this proposal period. Um, each, of the, each of these four periods basically runs for about uh, 23 days, I think. Uh, and basically, was it 20? Yeah, and uh, the proposal period uh, is this period where basically you can upload as many proposals as you'd like. I think Adrian will go into some, some more detail in the next uh, talk, but basically, you, know, you have this four phase uh, period. It's a very conservative, unlike the sort of the polka dot model, uh, it's a very, very conservative uh, uh, sort of a governance process by which you basically have to hit this, uh, this quorum, um, you know, very, very high bar of, of consensus. It started about 80% in some of the original Athens votes. It was uh, as high as, I think, 82% was the quorum. Uh, we reached about, it had about, uh, as a percentage of the stake, it was about uh, 86 or 87% of, of the stake actually uh, voted or participated in, in the vote. Uh, but basically, on this proposal period, you then have a yes, no, maybe vote, uh, <laughs> a yes, no, or pass vote, really, uh, in the second period. Uh, testing period, which you're not going to get into. Uh, then a promotion, a promotion vote period, which is another yes, no, or maybe you're basically confirming uh, that a protocol in our proposal should uh, make it to become the, the new protocol. And so as I said, it takes about three months to, to complete. So going back to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so what, what was Athens? So Athens was our first uh, member proposal. Uh, it went from uh, the end of February to the end of uh, May. Uh, it was basically just voting on con changes to constants. So it was uh, just changing the roll size, which is just the unit of account for proof of stake in Tesos that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it was doubling, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, we'll call it doubling the gas limit, but it's a little more different than that. But um, basically, the participation, as I mentioned earlier, about 87% of the stake in the expiration vote, uh, and about 84% of the stake in the promotion vote. Uh, and the reason um, it's so high is because bakers are, you know, mediating, mediating the votes um, for, for folks. Um, it, there's not, it doesn't require every single person uh, holding a token to participate uh, in, in this uh, process. Um, and it's mostly symbolic, so there's just a little, uh, you know, we have this notion of inflationary invoices, won't, won't go into that right now, but uh, it's mostly symbolic, just about 100 XTZ uh, reward, and it was really, as I said, just changing some constants, uh, and uh, one, only one team was really uh, involved in the, um, you know, in the creation of the, the protocol amendment, and, but at the end of the day, the, the one thing that's, you know, obviously pretty, pretty um, you know, landmark about this is that it involves coordination, et cetera, probably, so, uh, 30, uh, 35 uh, countries. Uh, and about 200 makers, uh, you know, uh, participated. Um, and so then the, the newer upgrades are, you know, the new upgrade that we're, we're going through now, um, it's, you know, going instead from upgrading just like changing, you know, constants, uh, you know, uh, to actually like constant, the notion of constant upgrades. So actually hopefully every three months, or maybe it's every four months, every five, every six months even, uh, you have some regular cadence of uh, upgrading the chain based on feedback and new uh, innovations that have been uh, refined and, and uh, you know, engineering has, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, the engineers that the various core dev teams have uh, can propose to uh, stakeholders. Uh, also, also with the, you know, the vanity hash of the original proposal, and now we obviously uh, had, unfortunately, had an, an issue in this one, so we're uh, actually been voting on a slightly different one. It's another topic for another time. Uh, I won't go into all these details of what's in there. Uh, but basically, there are a lot of challenges to this process. So uh, one of them is that uh, you know, one, you know, it's very decentralized. So there's actually, you know, there's actually, um, you know, nearly 500, uh, you know, different entities that are, are all around the world 
uh, participating in this, um, and there's also the issue, you know, so, sort of some some minor uh, areas of refinement um, you know, that we've we found you know, in doing this in the wild that around, you know, so for example, what happens if you find a bug half, you know, some way through the process? Uh, we're going through, we've been going through that uh, recently, um, and thankfully, you know, the, the most recent case we sort of we found it before the final, you know, confirmation vote. Uh, but uh, in other cases, you know, you could imagine this being uh, having been a, a you know consensus, um, you know, threatening uh, situation. Uh, and so then, uh, you know, also there's other issues around like, you know, you have sort of questions of coordination, so you have, you know, all these different forms in which people are, are discussing amendment, you know, amendments, and you have, you know, across, you know, as I said, 35 countries, so a lot of language barriers and a lot of uh, cultural, cultural differences, uh, you know, including, you know, pre-existing experience with, you know, with voting, pre-existing uh, experience with democratic norms, all those kinds of things, you have uh, different, uh, different takes on this. Uh, and then also we've had adversarial proposals, so this is uh, Brest, uh, the city of Brest in, in, in uh, Paris, or sorry, in France, uh, and this is uh, Baron Harkonnen from the, you know, from June, uh, so you sort of have this notion of, um, you know, people sort of trying to attack this, so it's, you know, potentially gameable uh, for, for other purposes if you can't uh, get your proposal, if you want, if you want to fork off, you know, you, you can just get your proposal, uh, you know, uh, you know, not approved in the Tezos process, and then, uh, you can, uh, you know, basically that, that gives you social legitimacy to fork off. We're going, you know, serving, serving this kind of dynamic for, for a while uh, now. And then other questions, you know, obviously about Tezos and other, uh, you know, mechanisms that formally stake is uh, what about the whales, right? So, um, you know, the, the answer here is uh, really, I think, a little different than that. I think, I think it's not just about uh, the question of you know, sort of or whatever. It's actually, you know, tangibly, uh, how do we ensure that we have flexibility against sort of hard on-chain rules? So, uh, you know, you look at things like Bitcoin where, you know, originally mining was actually like really widely distributed. And sort of over time, there became economies of scale. Uh, that's not quite uh, analogous, but the point is, uh, you don't actually know who's going to come to control. If you have hard-coded rules, you don't necessarily know who's going to come to control the system uh, long into the future. And so you need uh, other mechanisms or potentially uh, other, other systems to, uh, to ensure that uh, you have flexibility. Uh, and so a few of these are, you know, that have been discussed are, you know, some of things, you know, sort of inspired by, sort of now we realize it's sort of inspired by Dow Stack uh, as the idea is like you can do prediction games on proposals to rank proposals. You can uh, use this to mitigate, you know, sort of governance by state potentially. Uh, you can also do the notion, you know, there's also notions of, you know, if you want this to be, you know, sort of this economic infrastructure that can upgrade itself very conservatively, you know, you can basically set higher approval thresholds for certain uh, parameters or, or other characteristics of, of proposals. Um, that uh, you don't want to uh, change, you know, be able to change uh, the flow potential. Um, and then the other question is like, you know, basically are small stakeholders and smart contract bidders just krill in this system? So if you have whales, you know, who's looking out for, you know, sort of other folks whose voices, you know, you don't have uh, as much insight into. And so, uh, you know, just to, to wrap up, you know, that's some, one of the things we've been uh, working on for, for a while as well, which is basically how do we basically make it uh, easy for many, many stakeholders around the world to understand what's going on in the process and also express their, their preferences. Uh, and so we have, you know, initially sort of been focused on building sort of this Governance Explorer has a great forum, uh, but later you know, the idea is to build uh, you know sort of a full suite of signaling tools, uh, for, you know as well as you know, visual prediction markets, uh, and then also um, you know including things like DAOs uh, for governance as well as for commons governance. So you can think of things like domain names and registries and other types of things like that. Uh, and then lastly, like things like identity and, and other things that can give you sort of a more censorship resistance. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, things we can do that after. Uh, said after the talks. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, so I have two slides, um, because I'm mostly going to whiteboard this. Um, so, I'm Adrian, I'm one of the founders of Cryptium Labs. Uh, so, very briefly, Cryptium Labs is a protocol engineering team that also happens to run validators due to some historic path dependence, and by now it gives us a lot of insights into how these governance systems work, because we, instead of having to run every single proof of stake chain, we only run the things that are actually technically interesting, and we're very heavily involved in the technical governance of these systems. So I am mostly approaching this from an engineering perspective of, uh, it's like my approach is the engineering perspective to how these protocols evolve over time. Um, since Jacob said that I should briefly talk about the technical specifics of Tesla's governance process, I'll do that as well. Let's hope this pen works and it's for whiteboards. Cool, all right. Let's start with a brief overview of what blockchains are, right? We have some networking stack normally. Okay. I think my maybe off here. Um, then we have uh, 
Uh, slightly better. Then we have some consensus stack. <coughs> and afterwards, we have some economic state machine. Economic state machine. Um, this is quite important because this is completely agnostic. Uh, so when you think about what nodes of network need to agree upon, is networking, RPC calls, everything that um, is local to your node. It's totally up to you. That's why you have many Ethereum client implementations. That's why blockchain should generally have many clients. The only two things that they actually need to agree upon is consensus and the cloud protocol. Um, so for example, in the example of Cosmos, this would be tenement consensus. And this would be the uh, Cosmos Hub or Gaia depending on who succeeds in naming it correctly, we'll see. Uh, there's currently some contention about this, and there may be a new governance proposal about this as well. But specifically, the economic state machine sort of says what is a valid transaction, how do you get to move funds around, how does proof of stake work. Um, okay, cool. Now that we know this, I am, and when we talk about governance, in many cases, um, we talk much more about this than this, so not many systems have uh, modified their governance, uh, their consensus systems over time. Um, those are mostly stable, but I think we should mostly experiment also with improving them over time. Um, regarding Tezos governance, this is quite interesting because it affects a lot of this part, um, and actually this part as well. And so what happens is that there's a Tezos shell which you can imagine that it's a local thing that everyone can have their own version of. And it as input takes some protocol. Where the protocol is a combination of consensus and economic protocol. Um, and this protocol is written in OCaml. And what then happens is that the node will, the shell, and oh, all of this makes a single node. <coughs> What happens is that the shell takes a bunch of OCaml source files and then runs a restricted subset of the OCaml compiler to turn the protocol into something that can be dynamically linked into the running shell and then executes it. And then the tether shell receives network messages from other peers, so for example, new blocks, new transactions, and drives the single threaded state machine, which is the protocol. The cool thing here is that due to this, you can build a binding on-chain governance system where someone, or anyone in the world really, can inject a bunch of OCaml source files. Everyone then votes on the, on the hash of those source files. And if everyone in the network, if enough people, whatever your acceptance criteria is, and Jacob talked about this earlier, agree on the source files, the node at a predefined block, again, given in the upgrade, will decide so the shell will return, uh, the protocol will return. This at the next block, we should be using a new protocol version. And at that point, the shell will use the sources that it currently has, compile them on the fly, and then dynamically link them into the running binary. And that way, the protocol is upgraded. Uh, Polkadot is doing effectively the same thing with um, Wasm, where people vote on a bunch of Wasm code, and then no dynamically. Uh, we'll switch to the new protocol. Um, but this is how you get binding on chain governance, because in order to opt out of this change, people have to modify the shell, and then they can say, well, like the shell shouldn't upgrade to this new protocol. But the thing is, in most cases, you will also have to slash a significant percentage of your token holders, because what can happen is, let's say, you don't like uh, version A, like, Protocol A, which is the new protocol. Um, and so you locally go and modify this, and you now have your own little fork, maybe only 10% of the network is running this, but you did modify the balances. On the new protocol A, any can, anyone can re inject what uh, the community wants to upgrade to, and then they do exactly the same vote. And by default, all nodes again will upgrade to the new protocol. So you effectively either have to keep hard forking to prevent um, new protocols from being injected, or you slash 80% of the token balances of the people that actually want the new change. This is why all of this is cool, and there are many different ways to implement this. Tezos uses a restricted subset of the kernel compiler, Polkadot will use Wasm. Um, as long as the important thing, it has to be deterministic and properly sandboxed, 
because otherwise, if this isn't properly sandboxed, you're building a massive botnet uh, where anyone can upload code to and they will then automatically get executed on everyone's machine. And in proof of stake, this is specifically scary because all of these machines hold hotkeys that are used in consensus signing and can incur significant slashing losses if they ever compromise. Um, so yeah, we have to make really sure that we have a properly sandboxed camel compiler and properly sandboxed WASM interpreter for all of these protocols. Um, cool. With that, this is a quick intro to uh, Tesla's uh, how this looks from a technical perspective. One minute. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right. Then, really quickly, uh, we call it this. So, Cosmos Governance. <laughs> In one minute. In one minute. Cosmos <laughs> Governance. In one minute. You went for it serious. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. Uh, so, there's a 40% quorum. You can take two minutes. Okay. 40% quorum and strict majority. <coughs> so 50% majority. <coughs> and 33% um, uh, veto power. As a quick explanation, it means, so Cosmos, the way it works, it's a signaling process, signaling governance system, where anyone in the world can upload a text proposal, they have to pay 512 atoms as a deposit, this is to prevent spam, but once they've uploaded it, anyone can um, all the validators can vote on it, and importantly, delegators can override the validator's choice, but by default they inherit it. So it means that if you want to delegate your voting power to a validator, you can, but if your validator then does something batshit insane, you can override his decision. In order for a vote to be valid, it needs to have 40%, and of those 40%, at least 50%, at least half need to vote yes. If not half vote yes, then it's rejected, um, and importantly, if something is rejected, you do not get your deposit back. Uh, so you just burn like one and a half thousand dollars if that happens. And also, due to the way BFT works, if more than a third ever vote no, or vote no with veto, uh, everything, it won't get accepted either. Because in either case, if one third of the network doesn't like something, they can always halt the chain. Um, so this is why there's a no with veto threshold here as well. Um, right, then you have, the cool thing about having signaling proposals is that you can have many at the same time. So doing these kind of governance upgrades, binding on-chain governance upgrades where you vote in code, you can't have many at the same time because it is incredibly difficult to figure out how do you merge two distinct code bases into each other to form a coherent protocol that still maintains properties, like the desired properties of either. So with signaling though, you can have many running at the same time. Um, the deposit phase runs for two weeks, and afterwards the voting phase runs for another two weeks. The downside is that it's very unclear what should happen after a vote has been successful, right? Because we don't actually know the specifics. So due to this, the way you upgrade the code base of the Cosmos Hub is that you first have a bunch of votes on, we want these new features, and then hopefully someone builds those new features. And afterwards, you have a secondary vote with, where you vote on the specific hash of the code that you want to run. And if you're following Cosmos governance at all, this was the very, uh, I, I don't want to say funny, I spent like six hours sitting in the RDSM page. Um, anyway, there was a vote for the Cosmos of 3, which turns out um, wasn't properly tested, the migration procedure wasn't properly tested, and due to that, um, the new Cosmos Hub 3 didn't actually start, and so we had to roll back to Cosmos Hub 2. This cost downtime of two hours and massive months of confusion. I was very sad because I sat in a very loud data center cage for six hours while trying to figure out what to do there. Um, so, in my opinion, honestly, some of the best governance models will combine both. So you will have some sort of signaling proposal, proposals because it allows everyone in the community to have a voice to suggest changes to get ideas and high-level goals that you want to achieve, right? Like, do we want to upgrade to WASM? Do we want to have a new consensus mechanism? How do we want to reward people? And once you have sort of broad consent or like broad agreement over where you want to go, then someone builds it, and once they've built it, you vote on this very specific implementation so that everyone agrees and everyone upgrades to it automatically. <coughs> yes, okay, cool. I think I covered most of the points, and I'm only thinking like five minutes over time. So thank you very much, I'll be around later. If you have any questions, I can talk to you most about, I can talk to you about either Tezos, Cosmos, or Polkart governance systems. 
uh, we happen to spend a lot of time on all of them. Uh, so if you have questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Um, and so for those of you who are unfamiliar, this here is Stakey. Uh, in the Decred ecosystem, Stakey represents a ticket, uh, which is a vote on the network. Uh, and it's kind of like uh, our um, community delegated <coughs> mass. Um, now before I begin the talk, I just want to extend a special thank you to the Ethereum community for uh, in extending an invite uh, to us. Decred doesn't have any explicit link to Ethereum, uh, so something that I do find particularly admirable about the Ethereum community is not only its positivity, but also its willingness to welcome uh, ideas that um, exist outside of its immediate ecosystem. As I know that the uh, cryptocurrency space can oftentimes be quite tribalistic at times. So uh, for the talk today, I'm going to focus, Decred's model has quite a bit of complexity to it, so I'm going to focus less on the how it works and more so why we implemented, that, implemented it that way. Okay, so for a bit of historical uh, context beforehand, some of the, for the developers in the room, you might be familiar with some of our uh, developers' previous uh, open source work. So prior to Decred, um, many of our developers spent over 15 years hacking away on the OpenBSD project. Uh, they then moved into very early Bitcoin development, uh, releasing BTC Suite and BCT, uh, BTCD, which at the time was the first um, alternate full node implementation of Bitcoin. Then they moved on to release cross-chain atomic swaps. Uh, so that was released and made open source by uh, Dave, who is one of our lead developers, uh, and tends to be one of our more prominent open source contributions. So the reason why I bring this up is that for Decred, governance wasn't really an afterthought. Um, it, it was something that was carefully planned because the team had spent quite a bit of time uh, prior um, dealing with open source communities and having to deal with the various conflicting uh, stakeholder groups within the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. Um, and so, for that reason, it's... Um, uh, sorry, I lost my chain of thought, but uh, <laughs> we'll just go to the beginning. So, uh, Decred was originally conceptualized around 2014. So that was roughly around the, uh, the time that the team started to transition away from their Bitcoin development. Then we later uh, was, uh, underwent about um, roughly two years of development. We later released it uh, qu quarter one of 2016. Then in quarter two of uh, 2017, we had our first um, on-chain voting process. Um, so John alluded to that uh, in, in his earlier talk. And this was really the first time we actually got to um, uh, demonstrate the core of Decred's governance process, which is our ability to implement user-activated hard forks. Now, to my knowledge, this was actually the first time a user-activated hard fork had ever been observed in the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem. And then since then, we've started to focus a little bit more on uh, our off-chain off governance, which is specifically relates to the coordination of the various different contributors and the project's resources. So, um, whilst we were fairly uh, early in recognizing governance as, as, a, as a problem, I want to make it clear you know, that we're not so arrogant as to assume that we're some kind of um, governance panacea. Um, I, I think that just like blockchain, itself, there are many correct ways to implement governance. Uh, and depending on the particular problem that you're looking to solve, um, uh, the effectiveness of a particular governance solution is going to depend very heavily on that. So in the context of Decred, we, spoke, uh, we focus specifically on on-chain, coin holder-led uh, governance specifically as it relates to the, um, the consensus change process. And so, um, I'll just briefly give you an overview as to how that works. Uh, basically, we utilize a hybrid model that blends both proof of stake with proof of work. 
So probably the easiest way to uh, visualize this is in the form of something like an assembly line. So what happens is whenever a miner uh, produces or uh, is producing a block, they have to select a number of tickets or votes at random from the stakeholders uh, into their block. Now, in order for that block to be considered valid, and in order for them to actually successfully post it and, uh, and uh, receive the block reward, a majority of the votes that they include within that block need to be in favor of whatever block particular block type of this signal. And those vote votes are selected at random, so the miner can't go and just selectively choose the votes that are uh, exclusively uh, in favor of whatever it is that they're signaling. Now, so the, the whole process is on-chain and binding. Uh, so once an approval threshold of at least 75% of the votes within a particular voting window um, uh, have, have been accumulated, then whatever change uh, gets automatically implemented. So an example of this might be pro or anti-segregated witness. Um, okay, so uh, the thing about um, coin holder-led governance is, as Lane alluded to, it doesn't necessarily take into account all the, poss all the possible types of stakeholders that, that might exist. That's definitely very true. But what it does do is that it does cast a vastly wider net to proof of work miners alone. And so that, that was really the point behind Decred, is that we didn't want to eliminate miners because we felt that they play an incredibly important role. And we're still huge advocates for proof of work uh, as a consensus model. Um, we just felt that there needed to be a um, a greater level of democratization in the governance process. Okay, so in the context of coin holder led uh, governance, of course, the, the distribution of a currency itself is incredibly important. Uh, and that's why earlier I stressed that, that for us, governance wasn't an afterthought. It was something that was very carefully planned, uh, and the hybrid model and the distribution of the block reward was carefully planned such that we would have as wide and as fair as possible uh, of an initial coin distribution. And it's also for this reason that I kind of um, urge the Ethereum community not to give up on proof of work just yet, um, because it's an incredibly effective tool um, for implementing fair and wide coin distributions. So certainly if you're considering uh, a coin holder led governance model, it, it's not something that I would recommend moving away from just yet. But something else that's oftentimes overlooked with proof of work is that it extends a lifeline for those who might be politically persecuted. So I suspect that for many of us, we're probably pretty fortunate to have the liberty to pursue an interest in cryptocurrencies. But for a lot of people around the world, they don't quite have that luxury. And for many of them, the idea of having to submit your personal identity in order to participate in an ICO or to uh, access an exchange platform um, can oftentimes be putting their either their liberty or even their lives at risk. And so something that oftentimes gets overlooked about proof of work mining is it actually provides a discrete mechanism for individuals to obtain cryptocurrency using hardware as a proxy. Um, and, and so in the context of a coin, coin holder led uh, uh, governance system where you really want to have uh, a highly democratized um, access to the currency and therefore the, the governance process, again, proof of work is an excellent uh, mechanism to use. So just a few closing thoughts uh, before we end. Um, for those of you that are considering implementing uh, coin holder led governance systems, um, a, f a few suggestions that I would have is implementing a coin holder led governance system becomes exponentially more difficult after you've released uh, your protocol. So if you, if you can, try to really, really carefully plan out your initial coin distribution uh, and your governance process before you launch. Um, the second one is that uh, to, to, to make sure that you consider your project's ongoing resourcing. Uh, so I think a lot of, 
a, a, a lot of projects that I see, you know, particularly the ones that are raising outrageous amounts of money uh, in, in the form of an ICO, is that I think whilst that does provide some instant gratification, uh, something that a lot of them probably aren't considering is that those resources can actually go quite quickly. Uh, and then you can f find yourself in the precarious situation of having financial pressures being applied from external special interest groups, um, which can get in the way of your governance process. So for us, we had 10% of that um, of our block reward goes into a decentralized treasury fund. And that's where the off-chain component of our governance comes into play. <coughs> we released a uh, governance platform we call Politea. And so Politea is the Greek word for a system, or ancient Greek term, for a, a system of government. And Politea is just an interface where stakeholders can vote on, on where the various different funds get allocated to, and it funds our ongoing operation and uh, contribution efforts. So if you want more, where, where can you go to find out a little bit more information? Uh, definitely the do uh, documentation is your best resource. We don't actually have a white paper, so this is the closest thing to it. Uh, the next best resource would be our forum and, forum and our uh, Reddit. And then of course our bridge comms. So the bridge communications channels are kind of cool. We actually have our Slack, Discord, and Matrix chats all bridged together, so a message on one will show up on all the others. And this is a really cool place to hang out because this is where you see all of our governance activities being and operations being coordinated in real time. It's very transparent, it's very cool. Um, and finally, come and stake it. Um, just something that I really want to uh, urge before we end is don't move fast and break things. I think we should sort of transition away from that Silicon Valley mentality. Uh, ship quality code and consider its impl implications because um, implementing major consensus changes in this space is not easy. It's not, it's not quick and no matter how good we make our governance systems, I don't think it's ever going to be uh, uh, quick. Um, so really, really carefully consider code before you ship it. And don't compromise, you know, don't compromise to fit uh, gimmicky, you know, outrageous transaction throughput and silly features. Uh, don't forget what we're here for. It's censorship resistance and decentralization. Uh, and thank you. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions or, or, or wants to know more about specifically how Decred, um, Decred's governance model works, I'd be more than happy to take questions afterwards. You can come and have a chat. Anyways, thank you very much. Very much, Josh. That was super interesting. Uh, you guys are up to some really exciting stuff, so thanks for sharing. And I really like your closing thought that governance. We can't rush governance. Yeah, right? exactly. We need to. We need to um, have patience and, and uh, give, be very thoughtful and move forward, kind of incrementally and thoughtfully. Yeah, I couldn't agree more strongly with that. All right. Uh, up next, we have the one and only Litecoin again. Uh, John Light talking to us about Aragon governance. Uh, I'm sure probably everyone in this room is already familiar with Aragon probably needs no introduction, but uh, they're a project that um, has been really blazing a trail and, and just doing um, some of the most interesting and exciting work in governance in the Ethereum space with DAOs and many other things. I'm going to pull up your slides, but go ahead and feel free to kick off. Great. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Um, so for folks that were at uh, Web3 Summit uh, earlier this year or perhaps saw the um, video that came out, uh, this presentation is going to be uh, kind of a repeat of the, the uh, recap of uh, Aragon network votes that have, that have happened so far. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of briefly cover like how Aragon network governance works um, and then just kind of recap uh, how it has been working so far. Um, for a like more complete uh, review of how Aragon network governance works, uh, I did a presentation about this at uh, our annual conference, Aracon, uh, earlier this year, and you can find that video on YouTube. Um, but so, yeah, uh, let's jump into it. Aragon Network votes recap. Um, so some background. Um, Aragon Network is uh, the, the DAO that, that oversees the, the Aragon project. Um, so this is a decentralized organization uh, governed by um, holders of the Aragon Network token. 
Um, Aragon Network is funded by proceeds of the sale of that token. Um, back in 2017, uh, there was a sale, and that's how ANT was initially distributed. Um, so, bef but before uh, Aragon Network token holders could uh, govern the network, we needed the tools to govern the network. And so that's what we've been working on building, is tools for uh, creating and governing decentralized organizations on Ethereum. Um, and, and we have uh, one of those tools live today at app.aragon.org. Um, so once we had the tools live on mainnets that Aragon Network token holders could use to participate in <coughs> governance, we decided to uh, formalize our governance process. And so first we uh, wrote uh, kind of the foundational document of Aragon Network governance called the Aragon Manifesto. This was ratified by ANT holders in June of 2018. And then later that year, um, we uh, wrote up how the governance process could... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Siri is trying to join here. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying, Siri. Um, uh, and then, so later that year, uh, we, we formalized how the governance process uh, would actually work um, under uh, AGP1, which is, which is uh, the Aragon Governance Proposal Process, which was ratified in November of 2017. Um, so this is roughly uh, how the proposal process itself uh, works. Um, so there are six uh, stages now. Um, there are the, uh, the first three stages are just basically information gathering and proposal drafting. Um, then stage four, this is uh, slightly out of date, stage four is a community review period that all uh, proposals have to go through. After the community review period, uh, the Aragon Association, which is the, the nonprofit that, that kind of oversees the project right now, um, will review the proposals and then any proposals that get past uh, the review go on to a final ballot and get voted on by ANT holders um, in, in the uh, network vote. And any uh, proposals that are approved um, get executed and any that get rejected uh, go back to square one. So that's a high level overview of kind of how the process works today. Um, so. So far, we've had uh, three votes under the uh, Aragon governance proposal process. Um, the fourth is coming up at the end of this month, actually. Um, 33 proposals have been submitted on time, so like before the deadlines. 26 have actually made it onto the final ballot. Um, and then 21 uh, proposals finally were actually approved by ANT holders. And so far, um, about eight and a half million die have been distributed through this proposal process, and about three and a half million uh, ANT. Um, uh, participation rate, uh, on average, across all of the votes, is about 4.75 percent of all ANT uh, tokens in existence participating in the vote, and our highest turnout rate was 7.84 uh, percent. Um, the top three most contentious proposals, which I define as like the closest uh, ratio between yes and no votes, um, was a, a flock funding proposal for a team called Autark. So this was a team that was seeking uh, a relatively large grant to join uh, um, Aeron One, which is the team that I work for, as a full-time team working on uh, Aeron project software. Um, their proposal was relatively close in, in yes and no votes, uh, with 54% yes and 46% no. Uh, AGP 16, which was a, pr a procedural vote about uh, modifying the governance process itself, uh, also uh, relatively close, it ended up getting rejected. Um, and then uh, AGP 37, which was a retainer for an ongoing uh, Aragon Network security partner. Uh, this would be like auditors that are auditing Aragon software at an ongoing, on an ongoing basis. Um, and, and then uh, uh, maybe like a, a honorable mention uh, would be the proposals um, to reject uh, or, or prevent uh, the Aragon project from building on any blockchain that, that wasn't Ethereum. Um, 
that that, that one also had, a, a, I believe it was like 69% uh, no and 31% yes. Um, so some lessons that we've learned so far. Um, uh, it's, we, it's good to have a direct communication channel with voters to cut through the noise. So we set up a mailing list called the Aragon Network Vote Alerts mailing list uh, so that uh, voters can sign up to get like very low volume, very high signal alerts about when important uh, events are happening in the governance process, uh, in particular like when to actually vote. Um, so the Aragon Project is doing a lot of stuff. If you're following all of our channels, you're getting a lot of noise and you might not see important announcements about the vote. Um, Another thing is to put authoritative information about a vote in like one place and then repeatedly tell people like where that one place is located so they can find it. Um, again, it's just good to have a, an authoritative like source of truth that people know they can always go to this spot and find the most up-to-date information about a vote rather than looking on all these scattered channels and maybe finding out-of-date out information. Another thing is to keep the process as simple as possible to lower the barrier to participation and reduce the likelihood of mistakes. Um, it, it, I'm sure we could uh, you know, spend time uh, designing some elaborate like Rube Goldberg governance system uh, that looks sophisticated but doesn't actually accomplish a lot because people just have so, such a hard time navigating it that only uh, like either extremely dedicated or, or, or perhaps manipulative people would actually get through the process. Um, and, and finally, um, ask participants for feedback and use it to make the process better. After all of the votes that we've done so far, we sent out a survey uh, asking people uh, several questions uh, about their experience in the governance process, whether they voted or not, we want to hear from them, and as well as like suggestions about you know, what what they would improve about either the governance process itself or the user experience of interacting with the governance process. We've gotten a lot of great feedback from those surveys and have actually incorporated that feedback into our, our product development roadmap as well as our governance uh, roadmap. So this has been really helpful for us. Um, and then uh, some open questions uh, that we have uh, that I would love to discuss if, if folks want to chat after this would be like, you know, how do we increase participation rate while maintaining or improving decision quality? Um, you know, one thing we could do is like, just pay voters to show up, that'll probably get more people to show up, but will that actually result in better decisions? That's an open question. How do we protect against various attacks like vote selling, uh, bribing, or collusion, bad voting? Um, how do we run meaningful experiments while protecting the integrity of the Aragon network? You know, as, as the last speaker mentioned, we don't want to move fast and break things. We don't want to break our governance process, but we don't want to stand still either. We want to continue iterating. So how do we run meaningful experiments without breaking the governance process? And then finally, you know, how do we continually improve vote communications and user experience? The feedback answers have, again, have been helpful for getting some direct feedback from the voters, um, but um, you know, how, how, can we, how can we make sure that we're continually uh, doing this so that we're, we're always improving? Um, so that's what I have today uh, about the Aragon Network governance process. Like I said, we have a vote later this month, so if you want to see it in action, just kind of follow our channels, jump into our forum, and you can see how you know, the governance process is working uh, in real time this month. Thank you. Thank you again, John. Um, yeah, you have a very valid point, which is that uh, a lot of the governance ideas you're hearing up here today are uh, sort of still in the design phases, but I think what's really exciting about Aragon, as well as Decredit and some of the other folks, of course, is that you guys have been live and doing this for you know over a year now, and so um, jump in and participate and, and uh, observe governance in action. It's been really exciting to see. Uh, all right, up next we have Ilya, co-founder of Near Protocol. Um, yeah, Near is another really exciting project. You guys are very close to launching a mainnet, I think, right? Uh, you guys have a very different vision for, um, you know, the future of blockchain and sharding and all that fun stuff, but also governance. So yeah, take it away. Uh, show of hands, how many do you know about Near? 
Alright. Uh, so, I'll give a quick spill, um, but that's kind of not the main part of the talk. Um, so, NIR is kind of the way we started we were to build applications on blockchain. And uh, when we started looking at kind of current space of blockchains, yes, there's like scalability issues and there's a lot of people working on that. But actually, one of the main concerns that we had was that it's pretty much like really hard to build applications on the current system, right? Like coming from Web2, right, building applications with like Firebase, Parse, um, with like different clouds. There's so much tooling, there's so much libraries and ecosystem kind of developed. Here, the kind of, as soon as you approach this, right, it becomes extremely hard and it takes weeks or months to actually report. And then on top of this, like you cannot actually target real users, right? At the end, it's all crypto users, which is still a pretty small community. So figuring out how to get people to use this is important. Now, the thing is, like obviously, you cannot figure this out in it from the beginning, from the start. Like this is an evolutionary process, and to do that, you need to process how to evolve your protocol, how to evolve your kind of whole ecosystem. So hack the governance. Now. Like from our perspective, defining governance, so we asked, like, Lane asked what is the governance, but the question is, how do you define governance? Like, what is, like, A, our governance is blocked, right? Like, from our perspective, it's actually about defining the mission, like, what we're trying to achieve, and then culture of how to make decisions towards that goal, right? So instead of, like, oh, it's on chain governance, you're going to be voting and stuff, it's like, hey, we want, you know, every single person in the world have a you know, wallet and self custody their data and assets. And uh, we want every single developer to be building applications on blockchain. Right? That is a mission. And then the culture is how do you actually get there? What is the, kind of, um, what are the rules you follow? So on the other side, you still need tools, right? Like we are in pretty much uh, software space, right? And we all about building tools. And the thing is, like, tools can be very different. Right? We have Swiss Foundations, which is just a tool how to organize people, how to actually make decisions, and be compliant and actually follow, you know, still regulations of the physical world. There's off-chain tools like Twitter, Vatcon, it's great actually to, you know, communicate and make some decisions. And there's like on-chain voting and different new proposals kind of kind of like that. But th those are all tools to actually facilitate the process. And I mean, over time, incentivize it, right? If, like, let's say, it's on chain voting, right? There might be some process of reward incentive. So, kind of, one thing that's uh, usually overlooked is that different distributions actually work in different methods, right? Like, if you think of it, um, the best decision process kind of is not voting, right? It's actually a consensus when everybody around the table agrees on the same thing. They kind of come in with different view, and then through a conversation, through kind of figuring out what what is the difference in views, they actually figure out what is the best option to kind of align everybody together. And obviously, this doesn't scale, right? You cannot put you know hundreds of thousands of people in one room and actually make a decision. Even with a hundred people, that's already pretty unscalable. Um, and it actually works way better in person because like we have you know millions of years figuring out how to communicate to each other in person um, and uh, like chats and Twitter etc become like extremely um, we'll just say trolling over time. <laughs> now the other option is uh, this kind of meritocracy right? where you elect somebody who presumably is fast at doing this function right and this is for example like for technical decisions right you can like you know Vitalik who is knows a lot, you know, have been thinking about this a lot and can make these decisions. And then um, this is great and like this is makes sense for a lot of tasks, but uh, in kind of more global consensus, right, this can lead to a stalemate where like one person cannot have like kind of uh, cannot capture all the possible uh, roles in this ecosystem. And then the third option, right, is voting is kind of what we used to, which is great to get Decision to make to go to a decision from with a large group of people, but it's inherently divided, right? Like it's either yes or no. Like so there's no way to kind of have a nuanced conversation, and figure out maybe there's a better proposal. And also, some, 
very often the proposal itself is written by a single person or entity and kind of inherently has some biases of that entity themselves, right? Even they usually have some kind of vested interest. So the idea is to kind of combine these methods, right, and figure out how to kind of follow some principles and get to, you know, the mission and the goal we have, right? So, like, just to you know, be clear, there's no solution. We, like uh, later, we're going to talk a little bit about the tools we want to use for this. But the principles we want to follow is to make sure that there's clear goal, right, clear mission, and clear kind of OKRs, measurable metrics that you can target as a community, right? So everybody clear, like, hey, we want to get to more users, we want to get to more developers, you know, um, and be able to measure it. That's important. Right? How many developers right now actually in the Ethereum ecosystem? To me, at least, was a little bit unclear. Um, you want to make decisions transparent, right? So right now, like, it's actually really hard to make technical, transparent technical decisions, right? Because it's a pretty nuanced conversation. It's way done, way better done. Who's in the room, right? Like with whiteboard, technically discussing, but like making it actually transparent, right? Recording this, putting it in public, showing how the decisions are made, not just like, hey, this is a obviously safe for communities, safe for brands. Um, you want to make the strategic decisions right, kind of by bringing people who are representing different roles and like roles. We'll, we'll talk about this again later, but uh, in person, right, and get to a consensus. Like for strategic decisions, you want this consensus where like everybody agrees that this is the best option, right? And they bring whatever the concerns they have up front, and you can address them. And uh, for technical decisions, right, like let's say, hey, you know. Like literally, like we need to fix some bug, right? This is not something that like you need like huge community support, right? This is something that you can have uh, kind of elected people who are held accountable, but at the same time have can have like really quick decision making process. Uh, and to kind of uh, finish up is that like all those tools that we're building, like Aragon is doing a great job, right? Um, Tezos, Decred. But they all kind of uh, experiments, right? We don't really know what works and what doesn't. And what we need to do is we need to test them first, right? We want to give them kind of a little bit of state and see how these people will organize and how, like, what decisions they'll make. Is it moving towards the goal we set up, right? And then if it does, then we can actually have like a clear path how the state of the system will increase, right? So you can imagine, like, let's say DAO where you put in some amount of money to say, hey, you can manage this now as a for making decisions you want towards the progress of the goals it's set up. And then over time, as this DAO makes more and more decisions to improve the metrics, you actually can fund it more, right? So this is all like can be done programmable and kind of this is the idea. And to just finish up, like one of the things we've been doing is actually trying to bring some of the knowledge in the space public and transparent is through a whiteboard series where we pretty much interviewed a lot of protocols and a lot of projects. I think it was 30 right now in the whiteboard series. And we can want to continue doing this as well as like start publishing more content around different spaces like governance, etc. So check it out and uh, if you have some ideas what other content would be interesting for the ecosystem, let us know. Great. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, Federico is up again to tell us more about hey, Polaris right. governance. Four weeks? Yay! <laughs> okay. yeah, I got your slides, yeah. Hello, how are you guys again? Just curious how so many projects are using like metaphors about the rig, right? It's not only clear, but the and the Agora, right? It's that we are looking for answers somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, the thing we're going to start with the problem of incomplete contracts in blockchains. You know, Lane talked about white, uh, white and dry code. And there are some things that the computers cannot do. I mean, they're real. Um, some of the contracts are incomplete, which means that you don't need humans to do anything because everything is like, pre coded. But other contracts, and many contracts in particular, are that you need some human input for um, uh, making them enforceable. This becomes an important thing if you uh, think that 3 to 5% of transactions online end up in a dispute, right? And you will need some type of arbitration. And that's don't have 
up resolution system for this type of problems. So let's imagine Alice and Bob and they have a contract for a website. She sent the payment in an scroll account and they both agree that in case there is a dispute, this is going to go to Cleros. The dispute happens, Cleros selects a jury of experts and they're going to see the evidence and uh, the contract and the and vote on who is right. And then this says to the scroll contract, you pay uh, Alice because you were right. Okay? Understood? For now? How it works? So, how do you select jurors? Uh, that's a big question, no? And let me tell you a bit about how it used to work, of course, in Greece. And they had this concept of popular trials. Um, every citizen could go to be a juror in a trial, but of course, there was a very specific selection mechanism so you could not go to the trials with your friends to, to help them, right? So, um, there was a random selection for, of jurors. Um, so, first you work to the court and they, brought, they select you um, to be a juror or not. And then, after you're selected, they decided again by blood where you were going to sit, in which court, right? There's a double selection. Do you know what they used? What machine they used for this selection? Were you paying attention? <laughs> Claro? The Very good. Good. So this woman wants to, wants to be a jury in that dispute. She's a designer. So she needs to buy one of these tokens and deposit this token. What, why is this token? Uh, you remember this one? Selection ID. Very well. <laughs> well done. So Kleros has many courts and she deposits this, um, this token into like a court of websites, uh, disputes. And so a um, lot of people are going to deposit the token, which is the, the, the stating the, 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 the result of how it works. So the token, the token stays state into the court, and many people stake the token, and uh, the token gives you the chance to be drawn randomly as juror, and some of them are going to be selected randomly, and these guys are going to be the jurors in the dispute, okay? And the token stays long until a decision is done. So, how do we incentivize people to do a honest vote? How do you make sure that you don't have like, people voting like, ran randomly, A, B, A, B, just to collect money? And for this, we use uh, game theory. Who is this guy? Come on, this is a blockchain conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thomas Schelling. So, Thomas Schelling, game theorist of the 50s and 60s, and he developed this concept of focal point. So it's about how people coordinate when there is uncertainty um, and um, when they have to make a decision independently, right? So, each of you choose one number and if you choose the same as the majority, you get 20 dollars. Which one do you choose? <coughs> so, very well. So that's the shelling point. Any number would be like valid, valid to choose, but we expect others to choose 1,000, so we choose that one, and so this generates a like, coordinating mechanism into that number. So, if different jurors vote independently on the same dispute, knowing that they have to vote at the majority, then this creates an incentive in each of them to vote on the truth about the dispute. Good? These are uh, some uh, interfaces about how it works, and the jurors who vote with the majority, they get the token back, an arbitration fee, and the jurors that vote different, they lose the token that was deposited. So this creates, basically, a situation where users who try to abuse the system, like voting randomly, they will lose the token, uh, they will lose money on average as they participate in more cases, and the users who make the honest work of analyzing the evidence and voting correctly, they will make money uh, on the arbitration fee. So the vision is to create this justice system that can solve all the disputes of all the DAOs that are um, being created. And Claros has a, a court side and an arbitral side. Arbitral side is where you have like DAOs that have disputes and they send those disputes to Claros. And Claros sends back the decision about those disputes, right? This can be used for escrow transactions. Like this is an interface we built for you can create an escrow contract that is going to be sold by Claros. Uh, you can use this now, use it for paying our contractor, for example. Then, token list. This is um, 
uh, a token really, people can send tokens to a list and other people can challenge them if they don't comply with rules and players will solve this in case there is a dispute. And we are um, pushing a kind of application of this to create a humanity list. How do you make sure that people are humans or not on the internet? So this is a project, if you're interested, use Scleros for making this list and it's used um, uh, tonight, tonight at what time, Stuart? We have the meeting for the humanity. 6.30. 6 if you want to come to the Clerus House, uh, many persons are going to be there to collaborate in building this. Um, and Vitalik, this, this is creating something that Vitalik suggested into the, his talk at East New York, like a use of Clerus to create a list of humans on the internet. So this, if you want to come to this place and if you want to collaborate, Tonight at 6.30 at Pedro's house, I can send you the, the place later. And finally, Pedro's can be used for Oracle. Uh, there's a dispute about what is the right value uh, between two parties, and Pedro's can uh, solve this, this problem. So this is how the Pedro's system, system looks like now. And this is how it, we think it will look in the future, like when all of these other tabs connect into Pedro's. Um, so basically, is to solve the problems of the dispute of all other labs. Uh, and this is the standard way to pitch clearance. But um, there's more to this than the dispute resolution. And that's, this is what I want to tell you now. And I told you before how the Greek democracy evolved, but I didn't tell you all the story. Because remember Cleisthenes' reforms? That he created the assembly and all that. But the democracy didn't work after that. You know why it didn't work? It became like a tyranny of the majority. Because the assembly was voting like laws and it was crushing the rights of the minority. And this ended in a regime that Plato called the theatrocracy. Imagine being governed by Twitter, by the crypto Twitter, like <laughs> every day, like, uh, yeah, the decisions, right? That's how it worked in Athens right after the, the reform by Athens. And it ended up in a very hard dictatorship of the 30 tyrants <laughs> that killed a lot of people, and then a restoration. And you know how Athens became actually a real democracy that actually worked? Because they made a small change in their institutions. They created some body called the Nomotethai. And this was a judiciary review for all of the assembly uh, decrees. This is how it worked. You have the, the council proposing a uh, legislation to the assembly, a vote in the assembly, and then after the, the, the rule was, the law was passed, it was posted in the middle of the agora where every citizen could, could see it and could read it. And if they thought that this did not comply with the constitution, they could challenge it. And when they challenged it, the law went to a trial. So you had a jury of citizens that conducted a trial on the new law, like some with some of them being prosecutors, other defendants, and then a jury. And a, and a decision. So this decision could end up with the law being rejected. And it was all powered by the by the people. This is why very famous um, quote for Aristotle is if you control the courts, you control the state because you control what laws can be passed in your in your community. So a very important use case I imagine in Clerus DAO governance is um, creating this judiciary review of all the proposals that get voted in different, in different DAOs. But if someone comes and says, OK, let's raise the Bitcoin limit to 45 million, uh, or something uh, like, should X DAO invest or give money to some project? So this can be passed by the, by the community vote. Uh, so let's say that it passes. So those who voted yes, so they have their token that stays locked into their vote. And then the community can
can see the law that was passed. And if they don't think that they complies with the Constitution, they can challenge that law, and this will send it to trial. Of course, to Kleros, right? And Kleros will create a jury of randomly selected uh, users, and these guys are going to um, decide if this proposal is compatible or not with the Tao Constitution. And uh, there's like a trial, with different parties arguing about things, and this jury is going to vote, and if you um, voted for the proposal in the, in the proposal vote, and then this is overturned by the, by the, by the jury, you lose your deposit, right? And this um, is distributed to those who challenged, and to the jurors who participated in the, in the trial. So this is how I imagine Kleros to uh, be used in the middle of, of the DAO governance, John was asking before, how do we prevent from like, bad laws to pass and a bad um, vote to be done and vote buying? So if we have this layer of revision based on this rational mechanism, then this is a solution for that. So basically imagine that besides all we know about Claros, about centralized courts or websites and that kind of stuff, I think it's going to play a very important role in what is the governance <coughs> DAOs in general, as some kind of decentralized Supreme Court as a service that you can look and then you get the decisions made, right? And uh, the good thing about this is it's a Supreme Court that is going controlled by the users, right? And this is uh, controlled by people who are in the DAO, and uh, I think it's going to be really important to um, have solid governance for the blockchain. So, thank you very much. All about Zcash governance. Do you, you have no slides? I guess. Uh, I, I do. Uh, send Did you send them to me? Okay, sorry. I will get them pulled up. Yeah, no worries. I can start with them. Uh, you are the executive director uh, yeah, of the Zcash Cash Foundation. So yeah, we're really excited to have Josh here with yeah. us today. Why don't you kick off, introduce yourself, and I'll. Did you email the slides or did you? Uh, Twitter DM. Twitter DM. Yeah. yeah. Too many channels. Yeah, right. I'm on it. Thanks, <laughs> sure. thanks so much for having me, and thanks to all the other presenters for their great. Uh, great talks. Um, so as, as Lee mentioned, I'm uh, the executive director of the Zcash Foundation. Um, as, as, as uh, Honestly, I think this is probably going to be the most boring lightning talk of everyone's because it is, our governance process is decidedly the most off-chain, uh, it is the most sort of meat-space consensus, um, and, and actually it's also one that is uh, much more, I think, legally enforced um, than, than others, and I'll get into a little bit of that in a second. So first off, a toast uh, to governance, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Um, much like alcohol, a little bit is great, but too much and it will kill you. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think that generally speaking in uh, you know, cryptocurrency systems, you have this, uh, you have a, a number of set of stakeholders, and it's obviously, it can be a little bit broader than this, but at least in my view in Zcash, this is the way that uh, I tend to divide up uh, different stakeholders that may have different conflicting interests at times, may have uh, common aligned interests, um, and what we're kind of relying on is that each group relies and trusts the other two in, in some fashion, um, but they also have uh, some kind of ability to ameliorate um, any kind of disagreement that you might have. Uh, as as uh, John had mentioned before uh, about Bitcoin, there was the UASF movement during SegWit that was a clear demonstration of users overriding what appeared to be minor uh, and corporate overreach. Um, so what we in the Zcash, uh, like at least in the on the Zcash Foundation side and on the Electric Coin Company side, which is the uh, the for-profit entity that really has been responsible for the vast majority of development of Zcash to date, um, you know, we focus more on the development side of this equation, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So, we have this sort of aspirational model in, in the in the community of this two of two multi-sig governance, and the idea behind that is that you have these two separate but aligned organizations on the development side. Uh, one is the Electric Coin Company, uh, as mentioned. They're they're the ones that really started everything uh, on the Zcash side. Um, and they are answerable to shareholders. We have the Zcash Foundation that was set up about a year later, um, after well, several years after the company, but a year after uh, Zcash, the protocol that had launched. Um, and we're a nonprofit that answers to our board and, and mission. Uh, 
And we both are dedicated primarily to serving Zcash. Um, so in you know, 2019, here's kind of a list of where I see the roles and responsibilities of the Electric Coin Company on one side and the Zcash Foundation on the other, and where uh, there's an intersection uh, in, in between. And you know, where, where this really comes down to brass tacks in terms of how the protocol is governed is uh, how the Electric Coin Company decides to build and maintain the node software that users choose to run. Uh, how we at the Zcash Foundation choose to build our independent node software that we are in the process of developing now. Um, and then how we decide to interact with the zip pr uh, process, which is similar to the BIP and EIP process, uh, and how we, we come together to decide future development uh, on the roadmap uh, for the protocol. So what, what I, and, and this is maybe, this is not indicative of everyone in the, in the Zcash community necessarily, but my personal view is that users running nodes uh, are the ultimate expression of, of who has power in the system. It's really up to users to decide like, what kind of rules they want to follow on a, on a given protocol. And I think that was most uh, clearly demonstrated in the Bitcoin ASF uh, kind of a, a situation in 2017. So in essence, the most like real impact that we at the foundation have uh, in terms of governance in the Zcash protocol uh, is in our ability to uh, build and maintain a consensus compatible node implementation uh, for, for Zcash, which is exactly what we're doing with, with Zgroup. <coughs> yes. um, and what does that mean for sort of the zip process tomorrow? Um, time goes by fast. Uh, <laughs> so uh, right now, I mean, the zip process today, for all intents and purposes, um, you know, we, we do have um, a, an editor on the zip process that's represented by the foundation, but ultimately, uh, you know, whatever the electric coin company decides to integrate into, into ZBRD uh, is pretty much what winds up defining the protocol. Um, uh, there's a wrinkle to this that I'll get into about trademarks, but for, for at least on the, on the pure development side, that is what, uh, that is what matters. And for, you know, for, from the beginning till now, uh, a lot of that process has been kind of opaque, uh, and it's and it and it hasn't needed to be more open because it's really been more about like technocratic decisions being made about uh, things like privacy improvements and sampling. Um, so where it's going to go in the future is there's going to be this mutually kind of uh, selective process about what the ECC decides to add to Zcash D and what we decide to add to Zebra, and then there's a mutual upgrade to sort of network. Uh, <coughs> So this is how you know we, we keep that band together. There's the, that power, the actual power of users to run nodes. Uh, on one side is the uh, that plausible threat of an intentional chain split. But there's this other legal enforcement mechanism uh, with the trademark, uh, which is basically the uh, right now the trademark is fully owned by the ECC, but there is this. Um, there's a current agreement that's being negotiated in order to give both the ECC and the Zcash Foundation uh, power in deciding what represents Zcash from a legal perspective. Um, so this is a little snippet. We actually wound up delaying a, what I will be talking about in a second, a community sentiment collection because there was disagreement with the ECC about moving forward on the trademark. Uh, and this is like one of the most important things that we could have done, I think, as a foundation in order to legitimize the process by which we go through future upgrades. And right now, the reason this is such a hot button issue is we're in the process of discussing a future dev fund uh, for the, uh, basically an extension of the Founders Award uh, and who would stand a benefit from that sort of uh, award. And we at the foundation want to make sure that that decision is being made with a degree of, uh, of legitimacy and care. Um, so uh, just going into like how we'll decide what we're going to put into Zebra. There's the non-controversial ones, um, and then everything ultimately escalates to the board of the foundation. Um, but the board can use valuable feedback, and this is that community sentiment process that we were talking about earlier, um, and that, that I mentioned uh, like very, very briefly, uh, with the idea that there are many ways that we can collect kind of both on-chain and off-chain sentiment that can then be used to inform the board's decision. But like, make no mistake that ultimately, like whatever gets decided about what the foundation decides to put in its software is going to be decided by uh, 
uh, by the board. Uh, and I suspect that it won't go against what we view to be community consensus, but that's ultimately where, where that power lies. Users can still have the power to fork away uh, and, and, choose to, um, uh, and choose to operate um, uh, and, 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 and potentially engage in sort of a UASM style maneuver. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately there's this trademark issue that, that makes it harder to do that and, and thus really, I think, I think kind of uh, compels both the ECC and the Zcash Foundation to try and reach some kind of consensus about where we're going in the future. Um, okay, actually, I made it in time. Wow. Uh, I was a little worried there. I felt like I was rushing. But anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. That that is me kind of trying to blitz through that. But there's uh, there's a lot more that's going on on the Zcash side. I, I, I wholeheartedly if, uh, recommend that if anyone's interested, check out some of the blog posts that have come out from the Electric Coin Company from the Zcash Foundation. Check out uh, forms.zcashcommunity.com if you want to see a lot of the debate about uh, the future dev fund proposals, uh, which we're currently in a standstill until this trademark agreement gets renegotiated, which will happen very, very soon. So, okay, thank you very much. Cool, so I'm going to talk about uh, governance of games. So let's, uh, so late last week it be super quick. Uh, anyway, I'm Sean Kepia and I do um, research on complexity, cryptoeconomics, and I also build the Cosmos and Theory by Directional Bridge. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so what is governance? So governance can be designed, defined as either decision making or coordination of multiple agents. So that's what we discussed earlier today. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, decision making can be defined mathematically by just um, talking about a function um, which maps to a set of outcomes, y, y being the desirable outcome, and coordination can be defined as a multi-agent system where uh, multiple agents have to coordinate in order to achieve a certain goal. Cool, so, um, so let's say we are playing a very generic business dilemma game, um, and the game is defined as so, so um, the action space is basically corporate and defect, and A and B are playing the business dilemma game. Um, so the Nash equilibrium, which is the equilibrium in, through which um, the, the either player doesn't have any incentive to move from, uh, is it a defect effect. So it's at zero, zero, so the um, top, um, like I mean the bottom right corner. And it's defined by that, by that uh, function right there. Cool, so how can this game be modified? So this is the concept of game warping, where uh, the Nash equilibrium of a game can be shifted. Uh, and this game can be modified if a third player that has information about the game that these two guys are playing um, is able to make an offer to change the utilities of the initial game. And this is especially possible with smart contracts because smart contracts are publicly visible, strictly enforceable, and also uh, they are uh, frictionless to implement means that you wouldn't have to expend any money with uh, with um, legal contracts and putting lawyer fees. Um, and they're also strictly enforceable, meaning that any threat that you make on this um, particular warp will be credible. So let's say player C comes to B and says, hey B, I'm going to give you 1.5 uh, utility points if you cooperate with player A while player A defects. Now even though this is not the most rational strategy for, uh, for B, unless um, C doesn't exist, or if C did, hadn't made the offer. Now, by proposing this utility, it, he makes it rational. Cool, so, so then we have this composite game, where um, since the C is able to offer 1.5 utility points for um, corporate defect, um, C will be able to modify the game that A and B are playing, thus the, making the new Nash equilibrium to arrive at um, A defecting while B cooperates. So now it has essentially changed, the, modified the game in such a way that it does, is not the traditional prison dilemma anymore. And this is just one way in which games can be worked. Games can be worked even through pre-agreements made between two players that are just interacting with each other without the third player even existing. And there are many other ways as well in which uh, games can be worked, which I wouldn't go into details right now. Uh, but the point is that any smart contract that can be computed will be computed, and this is kind of the double-edgedness of during complete blockchain or during completeness of smart contracts, because anything that can be computed will be computed. So we arrive at this conundrum of do, do we consider compute power to be money? 
So um, I've sort of loosely defined um, how game warping configurations can be extremely vast. So the number of offers that a potential player C or a game warper can make um, is defined by the number of actions that exist within the game um, times the wealth of the maximum, uh, the maximum wealth of the warper times a combination of the players that the warper chooses to warp. And uh, this will be divided by the computational power of the warper because that's a key limitation. Um, that is limiting the number of game warping offers that one can make. Um, so, okay, so I, I'm going to ask, uh, so this is a game. Um, I'm going to ask the room to pick the number between 0 and 100, and the person that picks the number closest to half of the average wins. All right, go ahead, pick. All right, are you guys done? Hmm? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, how many pay people picked above 50? Show of hands. Okay. <laughs> how many people picked above 25? Okay, level one. Uh, you guys didn't make a random choice. If you picked, if you picked above 50, it's a, it might be a random choice. Uh, if you picked um, tw above 25, it's a level one choice. How many picked, people picked um, above half of 25? Okay, level two choice. Uh, how many people pick zero? Okay, cool. You guys are familiar with the concept, or you're really computationally smart. Um, okay, so level level K games is when um, you are able to make inferences that about your peers, um, about what your peers are um, choosing. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so with regards to level K rate um, rationality, one of the one of the um, key limitations for that is that humans are usually studied, or empirically it has been verified that humans are usually level 3. And um, computers can be as level high as um, the compute power that they possess. So, also when we're dealing with uh, a lot of these um, um, blockchain or smart contract systems, um, I, I have tended to work under the assumption that information is complete because everything is visible on a public blockchain. However, information is actually incomplete because a lot of beliefs can be private. Even when beliefs are uh, broadcasted, they can still be private because you don't know the true belief, so you can't assign a high degree of certainty to it. And um, also, reality is a fabrication of um, co the collective perception of all of the agents within the system. So there are things such as um, the value um, is also a perception, it's, a, it's something that we have assigned. The definition of a thing is also a perception. Um, it is also defined by the agents. And um, so essentially, we are not able to make um, very definitive inferences about those things unless we do, do so by empirical study, in which case it would be a probability distribution. Cool. So, uh, and then there's also this big challenge of um, uh, formalizing boundary rationality. So, so why do I call this humans versus machines versus humans? It's basically human designers that are designing machine systems that are supposed to coordinate other humans. Um, and the big challenge with that, or mapping um, through this, is formalizing boundary rationality. And the way we can do that is um, two ways. Uh, one, you can use um, Gibbs free energy. Uh, in which case you look at it as a constraint optimization, or you can measure a misfit, misfit using a KL divergence, which is basically the delta between um, the expected outcome versus the true outcome of the game. Um, and the constraint optimization is basically when the, the constraint is the compute power that, of the agent that's making the part of the calculation. And then we also have the complexity of value. This is basically an argument stating that you cannot represent value um, that a human has, or what a human values mathematically, and thus it becomes hard to implement that in a simulation. Cool, so, um, so we're essentially, uh, when we're talking about these kinds of systems, they do act as scale-free networks, meaning um, there are networks where 80% of the nodes hold 20% of the connections, and 20% of the nodes hold 80% of the connections. Um, and there, there are ways in which these networks can be resilient, but first we have to define resilience. So resilience, we can uh, measure it as, uh, as um, either uh, the ability to not be fragmented, or the ability to tolerate faults, or the ability to survive attacks. So we are not going to consider random networks because usually um, blockchains are more similar to scale-free networks. Um, so within scale-free networks, the attack survivability of blockchains is pretty pretty bad. So that's the that's the one thing that we should consider when we're thinking about resilience 
of a blockchain. So basically, attack survivability is the fact that since since there are such few nodes that are that possess most number of connections, then if you attack those nodes, then the entire system essentially fails. However, with regards to network fragmentation and fault fault tolerance, because of this property of a few nodes having a high degree of connections, the the network was in, would essentially not really change if you um, remove a couple of nodes from the system or if a few random nodes get influenced or attacked. Cool, so um, this is Lao Tzu, and um, he, uh, in 500 BC, he um, proposed um, self-organization and self-governance. So how do, how do we self-organize? So, we um, aren't very good at self-organization, as we have observed in current systems. Um, so, but then there are ways in which we can self-organize, uh, and, and we can also guide it. So I have to give credit to my friend Virgil Griffith for, um, for introducing me to the concept of self-organization, which he first implemented in terms of um, studying some information theoretic systems. Um, but essentially, self-organization uh, can be guided in three ways. So either you can um, talk about or um, change the change the control parameter of the system. In which case, the x will be made into some, another uh, x, which is better. So earlier I explained it actually graphically. I think that might, that might uh, help a little bit better. So essentially, if you have a system where it has been stuck in a local minima and it's just not able to move from here, you just take this and boop, put it put it up here. So. So that the system goes back to uh, dynamics that are, that are more, um, or to a state that is more desirable. Or you can have, or you can actually change the function itself. So this is changing x, or you can change the function that governs x. So instead of having it like this, you can transform it to something like this, or any other function. So essentially you, you would change the dynamics which govern any specific control parameter. Uh, and you can change this for any number of functions. Or you can change the entire structure of the self-governing system itself, in which case you, you change the set of all the functions that, um, that constitute the government, go the governance model. So all of the policies that are defined within the system can be changed. In that case, it is extremely limiting uh, in the sense that it will, it will um, not allow for you to see emergent effects because you're constantly modifying the way in which the govern, uh, governance model is. Um, whereas with uh, regards to just interrupts, you can, you can, be able, you can still uh, observe quite a lot of governance effects um, or emergent effects um, despite there um, being a little bit of intervention within the system. So um, those are three ways in which you can guide the self-organizing system to better, um, to better states or to um, having a better governance model. Okay, cool. Remember this guy? Um, so, um, so think about um, guiding the process in which um, systems can be governed instead of allowing it to completely um, self-organize by itself. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Sills, I'm a software engineer at Agoric, and today I'm going to be talking about the other half of governance that Lane talked about, uh, whether a blockchain can provide governance, and in this case, whether a blockchain can provide rule of law. So what is rule of law? Um, this is a very nebulous topic, so uh, there's uh, this great paper called Micro Foundations of the Rule of Law, and it's by Jillian Hadfield and Barry Weingast. And in it, uh, they basically say that the rule of law is a classification institution. So what they mean by this is that it takes the facts of the case, it's a, uh, it's a function that takes the facts of the case, and then it outputs a decision. So in this case, it would be, is this lawful or unlawful? Is this constitutional or unconstitutional? And they say that a good classification institution, it has these six characteristics. Uh, so it makes the decision-making logic publicly available. So if you're trying to decide whether or not to do something, uh, you need to know whether you know what you're going to do is lawful or unlawful, right? Uh, it results in ambiguity. It's stable. It's impersonal. Um, it's able to produce new rules um, by soliciting information from users, and it gives predictable results for novel inputs. Okay. So they say 
They say, importantly, that it's a mistake to presuppose that government is an essential feature of law and legal order. So um, this is from Google DeepMind. And you might notice that these folks are kind of acting a little strangely. Um, but the reason why they are acting this way is because the DeepMind project didn't choose to uh, instruct them on how to do things. It just chose to give them a goal of moving forward without falling. And so you can see they, you know, we got really, really different behavior because, because we focused on the goal and not the mechanisms of how to do it. And we can actually apply the same thing to law. And this is an actual approach. It's called the functional approach in comparative law. And what it says is that law is comparable if it performs the same functions. So if it solves the same social problems. Uh, I'm just going to give one example of this. So this is the law speaker. Um, and this was around the year 1000 or so in um, Scandinavian countries like uh, Iceland. And what the law speaker did was um, uh, he, as you might imagine, spoke the law. So this was how they carried the law um, uh, down through generations was that they had a law speaker. It wasn't written down. So this is very different than what we're familiar with, but it still counted as law. Okay, so um, given that, def that definition, let's talk about the social problems to solve. So there's this great paper by Anthony Kremlin, who's a uh, Yale Law professor in contract law. He has um, this paper called Contract Law and the State of Nature, and in it, he says that there's two problems, and this goes back to Hobbes. He says that one of the problems is uh, vulnerability of possession, so you know people can take your stuff, right? And uh, the other problem is transactional <coughs> insecurity. So this means that if you try to make promises with other people, they may break their promises. So how can we solve this? So uh, let's get some definitions out of the way. So I'm going to be defining a blockchain very loosely and very abstractly as a state machine. So it takes old state and new information, it has a transition function, and you get new states. Uh, I'm also going to be defining uh, on-chain versus off-chain assets. So an on-chain asset, um, by that I just mean that a blockchain is the sole source of truth for ownership or access. And by off-chain, I mean that something else determines uh, ownership or access. So this is really about social consensus and source of truth. Okay, so let's take a simple on-chain case for cryptocurrencies. Let's say that Alice wants to give Bob 10 tokens, right? So the old state, Alice has 10, Bob has 0. It goes through a transition function. Now Bob has 10, right? Very simple. Let's uh, look at an invalid transaction. So let's say that Bob uh, tries to take 10 tokens from Alice uh, without her consent. So as we all know, this would not work, right? So uh, because Alice has not signed the transaction, it's not going to be uh, validated by the block producers, validators, bakers, whatever, what's it, whatever you call it in your system. So what's really cool about this is that uh, it turns out that cryptocurrencies, uh, because they do this, they're actually enforcing property rights on the internet, in code, and without traditional law. So uh, A.M. Honoré has this great paper called Ownership, and uh, in it he talks about, I think there's like six or eight different uh, rights that are in the bundle of ownership. And it turns out that cryptocurrencies uh, have three of those rights. So there's the right to use it, there's the right to exclude others, and there's the power to transfer. Uh, so at Agoric, we decided uh, to uh, see what would happen if we tried to express more sophisticated property rights. So we chose to uh, implement a pixel demo based on Reddit's hard place. This is a picture of Reddit's hard place. And uh, in this demo, uh, we decided to allow users to buy and sell pixels, as well as color the pixels and you know, create whatever they wanted to create. But what we discovered was that um, this was actually implementing another one of Honoré's uh, uh, rights in the bundle ship of ownership, and this was the right to, um, to alienate the use right, maintain ownership, but allow someone else to use it. And it turns out that this is kind of the, um, the owner-tenant-subtenant relationship. So this is very cool. So we talked about vulnerability of possession, we talked about property rights, what about transactional security and contract? So um, the simplest uh, uh, example of transactional insecurity is what I call a swap. And there's this great example um, from Raiders of Lost Ark. Uh, it's not actually this swap, it's what happens right after it. Um, 
So I, I had a video, but I won't try to play it for time reasons, but uh, so I'll enact it for you guys. But Indiana Jones is trying to get over this pit, right? And uh, he has the idol, his assistant is on the other side, and has the whip that would help him get across. And so um, he says, give me the whip. And this guy says, throw me the idol. So Indiana Jones throws the idol over, and as we might expect, this guy is like, adios, senor, right? <laughs> so this is the problem of transactional insecurity. So how can we solve it? So we can solve this if we use a smart contract. And so um, what's really special here is that a smart contract can essentially own the assets um, and allow us to, uh, to transfer them. So if Alice has X and Bob has Y, we can send it into the smart contract, then the smart contract can actually do the dispersal um, safely. So this is really, really cool. So that means we've solved the social problem of transactional insecurity without using traditional legal contracts. And so you might be saying, well, you know, that was just a simple swap. What about, um, what about promises that unfold over time? What about more complex things? And, um, and you would be right, that's a good question. So let's open up the black box of contract enforcement. And so there's two steps. There's a classification step, and then there's applying the correct rule. Uh, and this comes from a great talk by uh, law professor Oliver Goodenough called Ambiguity and Legal Specification. But what he says is that, uh, so there's the event classification step, right? That says, has X happened or not? And then there's applying the correct rule. So if X happens, then do Y. And it, it turns out that humans are much better at classification uh, than computers are. So like, for example, um, in, uh, in tenant law, it's really important to know that the apartment is habitable. So if you were doing this with a machine, you would have to have sensors for like uh, carbon monoxide, for vermin, for, you know, you can, for mold, you can imagine all the things that you would have to uh, track. But you could actually just have a human being, a human inspector, go in and say, oh, this looks habitable, right? So that would be a lot easier. Uh, so human beings are great at classification, but they're terrible at rule application. So as we all know, there's a lot of corruption, misunderstandings, all sorts of things, right? So it turns out that we can have the best of both worlds. And this is where things like Claros come in. So uh, we can have a human classifier, human classifier say, yes, this is habitable, and that can be part of the input to the smart contract. We can also have human dispute resolution systems such that uh, if something is triggered, it gets inked out to the human dispute resolution and then comes back into the smart contract. So we talked about vulnerability of possession, we talked about transactional insecurity and how uh, property rights and contractors solutions to those, but do we actually have rule of law? So going back to the rules of a good classification institution, uh, so number one, is the decision-making logic publicly available? This is obviously true for a blockchain, right? We have to be able to replicate it, so it has to be publicly available. Uh, number two, does it resolve ambiguity? Um, so things have to be deterministic, we can't really allow for ambiguity, so I would say that this is yes. Uh, number three, is it stable? So for anything on a blockchain to be uh, used to solve these social problems, it has to be long-lasting. So I think this still remains to be seen, right? Uh, number four, gives predictable results for novel inputs. Um, so this is kind of a yes and no. Um, so on a blockchain, we can, um, uh, we, can, we can say if x and we can say if not x, and that's the entire universe of possibilities, right? But uh, at the same time, there's probably going to be things that we don't expect. Um, so I think this one is a maybe. We're working on it. Uh, number five. Uh, so a smart contract running on a blockchain, it is impersonal, right? Um, so on a blockchain, we don't even know who someone is. We don't even know if it's a machine or a person. So it's very impersonal. Um, and number six, it can produce uh, new rules by soliciting information from users. I think this one um, is also one that uh, the blockchain ecosystem is weak on. Um, we can uh, produce new rules by transitioning to new blockchains or, new, or upgrading to new smart contracts, but that's very difficult and it still remains to be seen how, how good we are at doing that. So in conclusion, we took a functional approach. Uh, we talked about the rule of law as a classification institution, and we talked about the social problems to solve, right? So vulnerability of possession and transactional insecurity. And it turns out that uh, for on-chain assets, we can enforce sophisticated property rights and we can solve simple transactional insecurity.
we're still working on, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, censorship resistant articles, off and we're still working on solutions for off-chain assets. But the really cool thing is that a blockchain as a smart contract platform can provide at least parts of the rule of law. So thank you so much. Um, and we don't have any time for questions, I don't think so. Thank you. <laughs>